Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the City of Delray Beach's regular commission meeting scheduled for Tuesday, June 14th, 2022 at 4 p.m. We're five minutes late. Um, please call the roll. Mr. Frankel. Present. Ms. Cassell. Here. Mr. Boylston. Here. Ms. Johnson. Present. Mayor Petrolia. Here, if we could stand for the pledge. Okay, I'm looking for agenda approval. Any changes, deletions? Um, might I ask a question on one item, 6 I 4? Thank you. 6, say it again. I 4. I four. Okay, resolution 92-22. Correct, thank you. Move that. You have a question about it, 7AA then it becomes. Anything else? If not, entertain a motion. Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sorry for my voice. Item 8A, I'm going to be asking for a postponement on that item, but I'll do it at the time of the hearing. You're gonna be asking for, I'm sorry? Postponement. Okay. But we'll do it at the time so we can do a date certain. That's gonna okay. be 8A. Thank All you. Right. A as an apple. It's a standalone bar, privately initiated text amendment. Got it. Okay, anything else? Entertain Mr. Moore, no? Okay, entertain a motion with um, those changes. Amended? Motion to approve the agenda as amended. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. All right, moving on to presentations. We have one presentation. And Mr. Dwayne D'Andrea De will be up here to talk about our um, Employee of the Month. Mayor and Commissioners Dwayne D'Andrea, Human Resources, filling in big shoes to fill with Lil Shay King not being here today. So, uh, but speaking of big shoes, we have uh, our Employee of the Month is Rafael Rodriguez, and the IT Director Jay Stacy is going to come up and talk a little bit about why Rafael is our Employee of the Month. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. I am so pleased to have this opportunity to recognize Rafael for his commitment to our city. Rafael came to work for us in the summer of 2020 when the COVID-19 pandemic was hitting us here the hardest. While many employees at that time were able to work remotely, Rafael was consistently here on site, supporting fellow employees that were also required to be here on site and helping to prep for the many late night virtual meetings that occurred during that time. He was always ready and willing to do whatever was needed. He showed us his rock solid dependability. And then a few months ago, the IT department was faced with another challenge. We were hit with three vacancies in the span of a month. For a small team like ours, that has a big impact. Job duties had to be redistributed among the remaining staff. And I think it's fair to say that the bulk of those duties fell on the shoulders of Raphael. He stepped up, he did what was needed, learning on the job and exceeding our expectations. Once again, he showed us his rock solid dependability. In Raphael's current role, he is often the face of IT. We do have talented team members that work behind the scenes, many of them right there, <laughs> lined up. But Raphael is the one you see every day. And I couldn't be more proud to have Raphael represent the IT department in this way. Raphael is an all around great person, a devoted family man, and it's a pleasure to work with. And in closing, on a lighter note, last week the HR department asked each department to submit, submit volunteers to dance on a video. <laughs> now, we, we all know that IT people are not really known for their dancing abilities. <laughs> We're usually introverts by nature. But in typical Raphael fashion, 
He took one for the team <laughs> and volunteered to dance on the video. Now that in my book is rock solid dependability. So congratulations, Raphael, on the well-deserved recognition. So on behalf of the mayor and commission, I'm gonna present you with this plaque, standing employee of the month, but also more importantly, a certificate for eight hours off with pay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you, Jay, for the kind words. Uh, yeah, don't even know what to say. I, I was going to make this short, but I feel obligated now because everyone's here, so I can't just, uh, typical fashion, say thank you and go, you know, leave. Um, I can't thank everyone and thoroughly as much as I'd like to. It would take too long. And, uh, Everyone goes home here, I still have to work, so I don't want to be here all night, because, you know. <laughs> but, um, so just uh, starting off again, Jay, thank you. Those are, you know, super kind words. Um, again, I can't even answer to that. Uh, the TikTok was by far the hardest thing I did, <laughs> for more than anything else. Um, my daughter does them all the time, so I, now I have an appreciation of how hard it is. Um, just a few people here. Uh, Don, uh, he's in vacation right now, but I uh, wanted to thank Don, Maurice, for uh, taking a chance on me. I didn't have a lot of experience uh, when I applied. So in this field, and a lot of fields in general, really, they uh, a lot of jobs want you to have experience, but they're not willing to give it to you. So it can be hard until someone gives you a chance. So I know Don and many others had to make that decision, so I'm thankful that they did. Um, Dennis, he's my manager sitting right there with the hat. Uh, just great manager, he doesn't do anything, you know, anything. <laughs> I'm not done with that. <laughs> no, 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 I'm still saying the, the sentence is still ongoing. What I'm trying to say is he doesn't do any less than me or anyone else. He's always, you know, answers the phones and takes the, you know, the, the crappy tickets that no one else wants to do. He doesn't, he's not above, you know, your regular ticket um so obviously thank him for that uh joey montez right there he's our uh, information security manager i had to get that right so he didn't get mad at me um he's always uh he's been my mentor for a long time we used to work together before um always pushing me to finish school and all that even a bit much sometimes i'd be uh on the computer looking up my fantasy football and stuff and he'd be like what are you doing and we play fantasy together and after a while i began to think that he was just trying to distract me from the fantasy because he never beats me so i think he's trying to get me to go to school just for that it hasn't worked yet joey <laughs> um but thank you either way and on all fairness and you know, all seriousness has uh, been a big help in my life so far so and uh, everyone else, uh, even those that aren't here uh, with us anymore here in the city, uh, Sean McClurg uh, was a, my co-worker before, who helped me a lot when I started. Uh, Ron Abbott, uh, also not here anymore. Uh, Ron still helps me with his notes, even though he's not here. There's still notes I read all the time. <laughs> and uh, everyone else that, that's uh, also started since, uh, Giampaolo, Umit, Kama, uh, Darcy, very sweet and kind, uh, so nice to work with uh just thank you thank you to everyone um this is really more of a, a team award i know it's kind of cliche to say that but whenever i help somebody um someone's always helping me help them so uh it's really a testament to the whole department um so it is a team award and the whole department the whole it department deserves a recognition but uh i will take the day off and i'll take the plaque with my name <laughs> on it thank you <laughs> With that, I think we're done, Mayor. Well, thank you very much. And uh, Raphael, you are the face of IT for us. We have um, had, obviously, many encounters, and we appreciate everything you've done. And I'll tell you, I think you did definitely take one for the team to do that TikTok uh, dance. And uh, I think that alone should get you that plaque in those days, that day off. So congratulations. Well deserved. Thank you. All right. Moving on to uh, comments and inquiries on agenda and non-agenda item from the public. Um, but first, we have the city manager re response to public comments and inquiries, and we do have um, uh, a, dis a discussion now. We, oh, we're ready. Okay, thank you. So, Mr. Moore. Thank you. 
Madam Mayor, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon once again. In response to direction offered during last week's City Commission meeting Tuesday, June 7, 2022, interest had been expressed to ascertain opportunities to engage with an organization known as Visual Adjectives, as well as possible follow-up with the Boca de Raton Museum of Art relative to opportunities to work with the city concerning Old School Square Complex, not only the Cornell Art Museum, but quite frankly, the campus as a whole. At the behest of Commissioner Shirley Johnson, an invitation was initiated to have Ms. Michelle Lawrence to join us today for a presentation relative to the scope of that organization via an initiative known as Art and Cultural Society, if you will. She's been well accompanied by her son, Trey, as well, who is with us this afternoon, who will offer a presentation shortly. However, in response to the inquiry relative to the Boca Raton Museum of Art, I've also had a discussion with leadership of that organization since Wednesday. So, Ms. Lawrence, Wednesday, as well as Boca Raton Museum of Art, Wednesday, Thursday timeframe to do my absolute best to ascertain whatever interest there might be so as to prepare for this afternoon's dialogue. And of course, Boca Raton Museum of Art, they reiterated to me that the opportunity that was presented back on April 5th, 2022 is no longer available for consideration. However, they did express a willingness to, at some point, discuss with the city of Delray Beach long-term opportunities to engage and collaborate in that regard. So getting back to visual adjectives, of course, they have an interest in offering their presentation relative to what they hope to offer in this regard. But again, Boca Raton Museum of Art, getting back to that for a second, they have more of a long-term interest focus in that regard, and we do need to take under consideration thoughts and, and strategies as to how we would get to that place. Nevertheless, the Art and Cultural Society initiative as being made available to you all in the form of a brief presentation at the behest of last week's dialogue is being made available for your pleasure and consideration as well. So with that, Madam Mayor, ladies and gentlemen, I think it would be appropriate to ask leadership from the Visual Adjectives Organization, represented by Principal Michelle Lawrence and her colleagues and son, who I've had the pleasure of interacting with and met to join you for a brief presentation, which is queued and ready to be offered. Ladies and gentlemen, please. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Oh, my heart. Okay. That's a nice picture. Oh, please. Okay. Greetings. My name is Edward Stinson. This and my is, name is Michelle Lawrence. Uh, we are Visual Adjectives, and we are here to present the. Right oh, thank you. Excellent. Okay. The Art and Culture Society. Now, um, Art and Culture Society is a 501c3 organization that fosters a creative consortium to advance the growth of the city through art, education, and entertainment. Um, we can go on to the next slide. Now, throughout this, we're going to work to build what we call the 12 tenets of the creatives. They are adaption, immersion, emotion, creation, development, expression, history, legacy, culture, heart, mind, and body. Now, these are, of course, we provide these through art, education, and entertainment. Um, these are the guiding principles for each and every project, event, and class that we will host on the Old School Square campus. Uh, our staff, uh, those who work with us, will, of course, follow these tenets as we continue to progress and create more uh, events and meetings there. Now, uh, you go on next one. The presentation is to show our interest in activating the campus at Old School Square, and it is the opportunity to administer and manage the campus, covering the 18th month period the city is offering with a possible long-term option as well. Go. Our goals and ideals are aligned with the owners of the Old School Square, which is the city of Delray Beach. Now, as we continue on, the main aspect of it is that it is a collaborative network, okay? We will work to report the managing of the facility um, according to the city of Delray Beach's directives. And of course, uh, we have formed this collaborative network with supporters working to foster a creative consortium, as said, that will advance the growth of the city. Uh, we will collaborate with local nonprofits and other agencies managing the facility according to the City of Delray Beach's directives. Uh, this allows for transparency and communication as they are fundamental to any working relationship. 
we are here presenting this option. And as you can see, these are just some of the uh, nonprofits that we do plan to work with. We have spoken to people from each of these nonprofits and know that they all have an interest in elevating Delray Beach and having it truly be a center of art and creativity. So as an example, um, what a collaborative network is, Basically, in order for us to keep pace with technological advancements, we are going to network and increase our collaborative practices with other businesses in the city. With the current knowledge and the instant grasp of information, and basically that geological, I'm sorry, geographical borders are no longer constrained, globalization is a concern for government and also companies in the era of competitive innovation. And innovation is the vehicle for economic change. Absolutely. So with collaboration, there is a survey by IBM Global Services that found over 75% of CEOs indicated that collaboration and partnering is very important to innovation. The study suggests a link between collaboration and financial performance. CEOs stated that the top benefits from collaboration with partners are reduced costs, higher quality and customer satisfaction, access to skills and products, increased revenue, and access to new markets and customers. This is actually on my presentation. It's not on there. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so you're looking. Um, we are pushed by the strength of our competitors to increase and increasingly demanding customers and you can say patrons, as well as visitors to the city. Mm -hmm. Businesses are going to engage in collaborative practices to face threats presented. The city of Delray Beach is innovative, our borders are not constrained, and we are leading the charge for economic change. I would love to see this um, follow through with what we're doing at Old School Square, as it is the hub of the city. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Um, as we continue forth, of course, staff and support staff will be needed. Um, there, of course, also will be a preference for people and employees who have a residency in Delray and know the city. Up here are just some of the uh, possible staff that we would like and imagine will be essential to running the facility. Of course, managers, uh, administrative assistants, front office coordinators, event coordinators, program coordinators, fundraising and grant coordinators, uh, box office coordinator, instructors, marketing and social media, and of course, volunteers and interns. That is also a primary avenue as to how Old School Square will really involve the community. Through interns, through involving the youth around the area, it will not only help those who are elders, older, and adults, but it will also help those who are teens in school at the time have a reason to keep coming back to Old School Square and back to Delray as a whole. As we progress, of course, we'd like to also eventually build a board and have board members that can help us uh, create a council of people to help continue making the right decisions for Old School Square. Okay, so I do have a SWOT analysis um, as we are a business and we do want to assess um, any things or challenges that may come up. However, we will need to um, for, we will need further information from the city in order to prepare a more concise budget um, with what we have with our bookkeeper. We will seek to offer um, financial transparency and diversity in our programming. We are working on the 18 month time frame the city has told us. So that is where um, our budget lies with that. We're not working on the fiscal year, but we're working on that time frame for 18 months. Um, we will be seeking um, resources to replace previous, previous things that were taken um, by the other occupants. And we will be increasing um, at 8% yearly for cost of living raise. There is a um, cost performance for shows, events that happen at Old School Square, anywhere from free up to $100,000. So there's a big range, of course. We will request a lease um, per year. And even though it is 18 months, we still would like to have something in writing. Um, the city will receive a percentage of revenues earned quarterly from us, and we would discuss that as well. We aim to not be subsidized by the city. We would like to put money back into the pockets of the city and the taxpayers as we live here as well. Indeed. Um, we'll be available to sit with the city manager or the commissioners on a quarterly basis to review any direction that the city would like us to follow 
and to make sure that we are following the way the city would like us to follow. We are currently in residence at Arts Warehouse, so at any time we're available for visitation. I believe the city manager had stopped by before, so we are always available. We've been established in business since 2010, so we do have a background that, and I have a resume, and I have a resume for everyone that will be involved in this um, collaboration as well. Excellent. Oh, there was also concerns um, in our past um, conversation about the facilities that would be represented in Old School Square, and my answer to that, as the gentleman said, previously with the tourism presentation is that we do want to cast a net in the city. We want to cast a net in Delray Beach. Murakami, I love going there. However, there's some people that's never been there. They don't know where it is until they drive by and see it. So we do want to offer a taste of the resources we have in the city that people can come and visit and then we can direct them to it or say this is something that Murakami is doing right now and then they can also go and visit. Um, and Yes. Okay. Excellent. So now we will speak about the different facilities that are actually on the Old School Square campus. For each of these facilities, we have a lineup of many different opportunities, activities, events, and classes that are all possible on these grounds. Uh, first and foremost is going to be the pavilion, something that is always being used continuously, constantly, um, and frankly is a very visual reminder of what Old School Square is all about. Um, just naming some of the community activities that will be, of course, continuously available on this campus. Uh, free concerts, uh, we're imagining where on Thursdays we have local towns visiting guests. Again, we're trying to really reinvigorate people who are already artists within this community. Outdoor movie nights on Fridays. I love movies and I love the drive-ins. These would be adorable sit-ins because that'd be weird to drive onto the campus with everyone. That's weird. But we would, be, of course, have people be able to sit down, see different shows and movies that are going on. We have environmentalism, different community gardens, tree planting, uh, recycling drives. We have photography opportunities as well, um, creating backdrops and different shoots that can happen on these grounds. We also would like to have community events there as well, community walks, runs for awareness, health and disability awareness events, um, holiday events, whether it be Christmas, Halloween, or veterans. We could have learn to play events, whether it be sports, games, or even musical instruments. Literary festival is something that is near and dear to our heart, and that is a project that we have really been truly working on um, as people who work at a Renaissance Festival, we know how much people love fantasy, they love stories, they love books and literature. The Literary Festival is something that absolutely can be on par with something akin to the Renaissance Festival, to the Boynton Beach Haunted Mermaid Splash and Pirates Festival. We can have that here in Del Rey, directly on campus, directly in the center of the town. That is something we would love to eventually really get going there as well. Uh, next slide. Excellent. We also know that there is the field house, the gymnasium. Of course, we know that different things are still being renovated. However, these are plans that we know can occur within this facility. Bar mitzvahs, uh, church services, birthday parties, <laughs> retirement parties, family and friend reunions, weddings and wedding receptions, different community dances, whether it be military balls from Atlantic High School. I went there. I love the military ball. We can have that directly in the center of the town instead of some random community center on the edge of the town. We can also have costume galas, dinner shows, we can have proms here, uh, events that we are able to host there. We can have art and jazz on the Ave, of course. We love that event. We've been going there the past few months, so we love it as well. This is something, of course, we want to keep going. With the community resource fair, craft and trade shows, town hall meetings, comedy shows and festivals, sip and paint events. We are adults. We like to do adult things. I understand that. Now, we also have the Fieldhouse Continued where we have okay. themed events that can go on. All of these are possible themed events that we can plan something here in this beautiful facility, all right? Whether it be Valentine's Ball or any of these other activities that we would like to do. Now, moving on to the Cornell Museum, something <laughs> near and dear to everyone's heart. We know that here we are looking to really get a lot of the nonprofits activated into this facility. Uh, we know that we can feature local artists in pop-up galleries, doing, uh, conducting interviews there as well, making sure that we're actually providing a space for artists to be seen, have their work seen, and have people consist consistently heading into the museum to see their work. We can have a Delray Beach, Arch, uh, Delray Beach Art Store, whether it be a gift shop, artisan's wares, art supply store. Um, I'm an artist, I love hands, it is now not here. I would like there to be another awesome art shop. It can straight up be in the center of the town. That would be awesome. 
Next, we of course have gallery shows open during evening evenings and weekend shows as well, continuously showcasing the work, whether it be museum work or it be artwork that is there uh, on display. We have museum exhibits that represent the different historical items, documents, and eras that can also be on display throughout the year, whether it be Native American, African, Caribbean, Spanish, Florida's history, World War I, World War II, the Renaissance itself, the Civil War, or even the train history. Honestly, trains are really cool. I didn't think I was going to grow up loving trains, but they're really awesome machines. I'd love to showcase those there as well. And of course, living history events. Again, we work at the Renaissance Festival. I cannot express how important it is for people to see living history and then interact with it. <clears throat> Next, we also have the Creative Arts School and Crest Theater. We know it is under renovations. That does not stop us from still imagining what potentially could be there as we conduct this uh, facility. Um, Oh, continue. Ooh, bless. Oh my gosh, that is nice. Sorry, I did not know she put that in there. That's a nice one. So, in the Creative Arts School, we know it's under renovations. However, this also still allows activities, events, and classes that we totally imagine to be there for activities, our art projects, art workshops, writing workshops, um, book clubs, music making groups, free tax filing for the community. Again, another way to truly involve the community and get them to keep coming to the side of the road. Um, Planned events, authors' book signings, board game days, I love board games as well, shameless plug, book exchanges, food drives, lectures and master classes, royalty where we love the idea of dressing up and just having tea and having a good time with the community, uh, spring break programming through the summer and of course winter break. For creative classes, there is an unnecessary amount of possible classes that we can host here, whether it be an apothecary, a painting class, watercolor, dance, cardio, a copywriting class, learning how to make a graphic novel, sewing, photography, or even singing. All of these are possible to teach as long as there is space to hold these events. Continuing on, we also know that there can be an audio studio space available. So we can conduct author interviews, book or movie reviews, magazine editing workspace, podcast recording. We can also have book publishing services and live stream events for the city. Again, all at this hub of art creation and perspective. Next, uh, we again know it's under renovation. That is okay, we can still keep imagining for it. For performance and interaction, we know that there are acting and improv classes that we can continue on. Children's acting, set design, weekly evening shows, improv and comedy shows, theater projects, um, 1940s radio show. Um, <laughs> when I told this to my dad, he was like, wait, what do you mean 1940s? But also that is one of the most like hilarious time and voices. And in today's news, the Crest Theater is here. Like that's awesome. We can totally have really awesome events where we again are expressing acting, expressing creativity. So we're able to have those little bits. <clears throat> Next, of course, we will go on and express many of the different possible calendar events where, um, as stated in previous meetings, we can start this month and continue on for every month after it with one of these different events, actually a couple or several of these different events where we can have event weekly going on at the, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, this is not done in a calendar format, oh, okay. but it is a list format because the city is already having events mm -hmm. at, the, at, the, at the campus. So instead of competing with what's happening, we do have the list that's available, and then we can work with the Parks and Recreation mm -hmm. Department, who is com currently managing the campus, mm -hmm. and we can work around their schedule. Mm -hmm. And then input any of these events that we're going to go on for the next couple pages. Um, again, each of them, I already know there is a there is an audience for each of these events um, that are going to be presented. Oh, he can go back. One more. So. Oh. <laughs> So <laughs> we'll have 60s, 70s, and 80s nights, I'm not going to lie. Those are some uh, interesting eras, and we can have theme costume nights, whether it be movies or anything of the sort. Uh, art walks, which already happened, battle of the bands, business raffles, continue on, chess tournaments, different game days. We can have escape room mini events. We can have cosplay weekends, cook-off events, uh, bake-offs, food truck rallies, continue on. We're able to, of course, have uh, Get Fit Del Rey, high school fundraisers, ice cream festivals, mead festivals, again. We're adults, meat is delicious. All of you should try it. Uh, we also have Mediterranean food festivals, motorcycle shows, continue on. We can have RC car races, scavenger hunts, steampunk festivals, sweet corn festivals, delicious. We can have wine tasting, wellness programs. There is a countless number of events and activities that we can host on this campus at this facility. Yep, and, and that's it. Yep, and that is our presentation for it. Bless you. May I ask a question? Anything. 
Thank you. Yeah. I'm totally into fantasy. I really appreciate your enthusiasm, and I had the opportunity to speak with your mom. But um, my fantasy is that this place be self-sustaining or even profitable. Of course. So what is it that you, when I spoke to your mom, it sounded like what you have is a network. Mm -hmm. And But what do you have you to management skills, accounting, business experience. Can you tell us about what your experiences are here? Yes. What? So I have run a publishing company since 2010, successfully. And we currently have over 40 titles that we've published. I also work for Palm Beach County, Board of County Commissioners, for at least a um, little over 10 years. I was a facility manager. I was also a computer specialist. That is my That was my um, forte when I got out of the military. I was an aviation machinist mate in the United States Navy. And since I've been doing publishing, I've also done some IT consultant, as that is a part of our um, training for classes. We do workshops for writing, for art. I am a graphic designer as well. I do use my skills for our company. A lot of the stuff that we do is self-sustaining. I've done our business for over 12 years, and I've been the CEO, I've been the graphic designer. when. It's needed. I am very meticulous when it comes to doing my work. Um, if something is not done, I do it myself because that's how I, that's how I, was, I grew up. I was in ROTC, and that's what my colonel taught me. So uh, I actually do have my resume that I can provide as well as the managers that we are looking to help run the facility. Right, and this so here's, and you know, I appreciate what you're saying. But when we spoke the other day mm -hmm. and I said, how would you view the museum? You said, well, we would network to hire a curator. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. But I mean, do you have any experience doing that whatsoever? As as far as history of a museum? Or like to be the curator. To be the ourselves. curator of a museum. Anything related to a museum. Um, technically, we do very well at represent the Ottoman Empire. Um, and we've done that for the past seven years. It is not in a building. It is actually at the festival. However, it is technically still considered a history, historical It is, it is living history. It is yeah. living history. Get, if you don't mind me just getting to the point, because I'm mm -hmm. sure. lacking in uh, the ability to talk for long periods of time. When we spoke the other day, and I, Ms. Johnson asked us to reach out to you after you came and mm -hmm. didn't get the opportunity to do the presentation. And it's lovely. It's very thoughtful. It's very expansive. Everything sounds amazing. But mm -hmm. we, we need people with experience in there running the place. Sure. And when I talked to you the other day, you said you would be very content doing mm -hmm. your class, which I have to tell you, I think is remarkable. Mm -hmm. Publishing books for kids okay. through a class, I like it. Um, and then two shows. But now you're here and you're saying we want to run the entire facility. And I'm respectfully saying we've gone down this road. The last people we had managing the facility, very well-meaning local people, but it's a multi-million dollar facility and notwithstanding the dollar a year lease and between 750,000 to 900,000 annually from the residents, they could na not make operations work and they got substantial donations. Deputy Vice. The, never mind. Deputy Vice. So I would like to know how you, what is your financial situation going in here? How do you expect to walk in the door and open up the place? So you got, I won't take that oh. from you. Basically, when I spoke to you before, it was with the contingency that the city of, I'm sorry, the Boca Raton Museum would be here to do their. Oh, so you're still interested in. And that. I am willing to work with them if I have to, because it is a city owned property. Right. So I am not here to tell you what I want. I'm here to ask. 
I am presenting to you everything that we can do and put okay, all I of our cards on the table. Thank you for clarifying that. So, That's yes. perfect. Our first conversation started like that, and then you narrowed it down to what I think is totally in your wheelhouse and doable. I think your festivals, some of the events you talk about sound amazing. I love the classes that you discuss with me. I think they sound amazing. But to be very honest with you, and I want to, when you say we want to run the whole facility, I would have to say to you, today at this point in time, I don't see that as feasible. Does that mean you can't grow in the future? Absolutely not. So statement, I, that is why it is essential that we very much so brought the staff and support staff sheet here. Um, I think it is extraordinarily important that when we say we have a network of people, we have a team of people who already are able to and they be managers, administrative assistants, front office, event program. So it really isn't just us two right here. We're the only human beings trying to run the entire facility. That doesn't even sound logical to us. Right. So we have we're, that's what it sounded yeah. like in no, your presentation. We, that's why we said a collaborative network. Yes, because Strictly, we understand. Strictly, and I explained the whole collaboration. Right, but I think there needs to be one person at the top of this network, and I I'm being honest with you. It will be. It, right, and yes. I think it needs to be an organization that has experience in the area. This is a cultural arts facility that is, you know, at the center of our downtown, and it's very unique, right, because there are none like this in the surrounding area. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate what you bring to the table, and I am all in favor of an arrangement with you that involves you engaging some of your classes and you doing tour of your festivals as I discussed beyond that I could not commit to you uh, at this point in time without some track record some history some and, relationship and, and I would love if for. you are willing to start that no what, what I'm asking for and that's the reason we started with our first page of we are here to do blah is that I have never sat with anyone on on the board personally in an office and as I would if I was interviewing for something, I would expect some form of question, some line of question about who I am, what I can do, my abilities, and what I can bring to the table. And I think coming that's happening to, right now, right? I understand. But coming to this meeting and it being called last Thursday, I was waiting for the charrette on the 23rd, and that's what I expected. And that's when I expected to come in front of the city manager and then he would tell me what the city and also the commissioners wanted. And then I would bring that to you. However, being called, I mean, I, a new game came out this weekend and that was my plan. So I had to cancel that to do this. However, it is last minute. So I did put this together in about a day. Oh, I thought so, this was for our last meeting. It was for the last meeting. However, because you guys specifically said certain things, I had to move things around i had to add this after speaking with the city manager there were certain things you guys wanted to know that i had to put in here and everything we presented to you is what we when we came to you the first time we had it's your so aspiration if, and I, yes I if you said hey let me see your resume then i would send it to you i would send you my list of credentials i will send you the list of credentials for everyone else and I mean, he works at a museum right now. So, you know, I actually learned Turkish to represent the Ottomans. Um, helps, we helps. have our Malia Kalfa back there who actually learned Turkish as well. Uh -huh. So we're not shy from, you know, doing what we need to do. We've been doing an encampment for the last seven to eight years and it's very successful. It is probably the best encampment at the festival. It may not be a uh, Standing museum. Standing museum, but we do face-to-face -face interaction with over 200,000 people in a seven-week period. And that's, you know, compacted that we have to, on the fly, improv every day. Mm -hmm. There's kids that come and they never been to a festival and we have to make them feel comfortable. There are older people that come in. So we do things. Furthermore, it is extremely yeah. important that you did mention the fact that it is unique and there's nothing else like it. So. Um, that not that it's a contradiction, but it does matter that you are also acknowledging there isn't anything else like this in the area to yeah. actually do. You're asking so what we can do. We're we going to show you. Yeah, we have. We're going to show you what we, we can are do. able to do it. 
We haven't owned an old school square before. I'm pretty sure. Well, no, no one, one has, has. Except old school square. 18 months. We're asking for 18 months. Yeah. That's it. That's what you guys said. That's what you asked for. And that's what we're going to give you. 18 months after that, you can kick us out, but we're still going to be in Delray Beach. I would say to you, to, and so I love the enthusiasm and the way you guys, you compliment each other. It's lovely. I would be 100% willing for 18 months to allow you the shows that we discussed and the class that we discussed. And I think I, and, and I'm excited to um, see what you bring to the table. Okay, and if you don't want us in the museum, that's fine. We were just telling you, again, it was what we had in our first presentation, and that's what we brought to you. Right, and I loved what you said. You said, we want to help you, and we will figure out how to do it. And I really thank you for that. And I think how you can help is to collaborate with, you know, the experts and see how the, where this takes us. It's a journey that we're all going on together. May I? And I thank you. Okay, Commissioner thank Johnson. You. Thank you, Deputy uh, Vice Mayor. I, uh, this is the first opportunity we've had to talk about something that's positive. And I think because we are so focused on what has been there before, we may have, I, some of us, may have a closed mind as to what the possibilities are. I am going to be meeting with the Boca Museum tomorrow with the hopes that we can bring them back on board because it appears that it can't be done without this body being the ones to do it. So I had hoped that with the two collaborating, and Ms. Lawrence has said that it is her objective to present what's possible, and they are, I think, something we've never seen before, and we will not see them if we don't give it an opportunity. However, I have heard from a number of residents who feel that the Boca Museum is what needs to be here and can complement what they're bringing, understanding that we have had no other organization come forward. So a collaboration, as I have continuously said, is what we're going to need. And anyone who wants to come and work with us, I'm willing to give them an opportunity to work with us. I want to work with whatever suits the city. And if we're going to lean towards the Boca Museum having the first class uh, offering, I am more than willing to do that. I'm going to meet with uh, the gentleman tomorrow, and so we'll go from there. Thank you. Um, I just want to say I, I understand we are talking about the Boca Museum, but they are not here, and we're talking about what we want to talk about. Um, that's off the table right now because they're not here. And when I showed up, it was Visual Additives, Boca Museum, and again, when you speak with them, we're willing to work with them if we have to. Again, it is your building. I cannot come into your house and tell you what we're going to do. So if that's yeah. where you put us, that's fine. However, there are four more locations on the campus that we are talking about. So that is what I want to focus on while we're here. I don't mind the Boca Museum. That's great. Enough love. But um, this is where we are with what we have. And you've, been, you've done a wonderful uh, presentation. And that's all you've ever wanted to do was make a presentation. This is the first opportunity. And I can't understand why it was so difficult to get to this point. But I appreciate your willingness to keep fighting so that you can have this opportunity. And with the last minute, and I quite understand that we have thrown it at you in less than seven days. I ask if you could meet with each of the co uh, commissioners and the mayor, and with the tight schedule that everyone has, I'm sure you may not have been available or able to make that happen. So I appreciate your continuing to fight to bring your opportunities to us. I don't see anyone else in the arena, and for 18 months, I would think <coughs> that uh, with the collaboration that I'm hoping is going to happen, that we can go forward. We don't want a dark campus any more than we can um, stop it from happening. So uh, it's a work in progress, and I, I appreciate the open-mindedness of each of you in listening, and uh, we shall see. Anyone else? Okay. okay. Um, so Michelle, thank you, thank you very much for, cl for clarifying that, um, because I think 
Commissioner Johnson requested that you give an, get an opportunity to, to present. We all had a consensus, and that was a, you were going to be on a future agenda to present to us. And when, that's what you did today. And I think it's, it's cl clear in your presentation that you were here to show your interest in activating the campus at Old School Square. Mission accomplished. You have showed your, you have showed your interest. Okay. Separately, M Commissioner Casal asked for us to have a discussion in regard regards to the Boca in regards to the Boca Museum. Separate item. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, it's put on the agenda like it's the like it's the mm -hmm. same item. So I'm really I'm glad you clarified that. I know you had some questions uh, right before the meeting mm -hmm. um, in regards to the the wording of that. So there are two separate things. I I know you've gotten a lot of phone calls uh, as you shared with me mm -hmm. um, about partnering with Old School Square to get them across the line. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and and I really appreciate you you know sticking to your uh, your guns here and coming and presenting what you guys have a vision for, because I'll tell you. You're not short on ideas, that's for sure. Um, and, uh, and your ideas actually had me smiling. I'm like sitting here and I'm picturing some of these things actually happening in the space. Uh, a lot of them, from what I saw, um, wouldn't require an incredible amount of funds. I think that's what's interesting. I think a lot of the things that you've probably done in the past, you know how to kind of value engineer those type of events because the reality is, if you're a curator of uh, an art museum, you can only bring in what you can really afford, yeah. right? The bigger the check you can write, the bigger the exhibit that you can bring in. Um, but what, what I think impresses me about Arts Garage and Arts Warehouse is uh, they're not always working with that big checkbook. They have to use, utilize their network, they have to utilize their connections, and uh, in their story to bring in that art. Uh, and I think that's uh, really powerful to have that. And the words I heard, immersive, experiential, um, half, half my team at my company is between the age of you know, 23 and 30. That's what they're looking for when it comes to art. Yeah. They're not looking to walk quietly around a, around a museum for art. Mm -hmm. They are looking, they, they tell me about things I've never heard of um, when it comes to experiential immersive art um, in places like Wynwood or in, in, in St. Petersburg. Um, I love your idea. I'm, I, was a, I was a big uh, fan of the art shop. Anytime I needed a gift for somebody, I would go in the art shop. I felt like that was a little a little secret shop, and I see Mariska smiling over there. Um, but to even add to that, um, some artisan wares, and then to pick up on the fact that we did lose our uh, our uh, art shop, yeah. you know, hands here in town, and to pick up on that need and try to fill that need, I gotta I gotta give you a lot of credit. And and um, from from sweet corn festivals to steampunk festivals, <laughs> that should be like your your tagline. That would cover about everything. <laughs> um, so here here's what I, I'd say. Um, I want you guys at the table, right? As we move forward, and you have shown your interest in your great ideas, and I hope you'll be there. Staff has shared with me just the other day the process of this summer really leaning on staff to uh, put a plan together and all of our cultural partners. To try to activate it towards the end of towards the end of the summer. Meanwhile, going through a RFP process, and I hope you guys will answer that because that's really the proper way for us to for us to move forward is to have these public charrettes, which I know that you'll engage in. Hear the community, put an RFP together, and uh, and then let let people uh, let organizations respond to it. And a lot of times, there's partnerships yeah. that respond to those. It's not just single entities; exactly. it's entities that partner up together and put a proposal in together. And that's really the proper way for us to move forward. And I'm, I'm really glad that I got to meet with staff yesterday and they gave me that plan. So we're stick with that plan and uh, I really hope you're there. I hope you're there uh, at the table. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Uh, Michelle Edward, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure I'm right about this. Your website, visualadjectives.com? Okay. I went to a, to try to get some more information about your background, your history, where you've done some of the things, and I see you're a, a literary company. Yes, literary. Okay, so that's your primary. Yes, mm -hmm. publishing. You want to make sure. It's being updated, so yes. So I, I equate it to this, and, and I appreciate the plan, and I hope you come forward to the charrette next week. Um, I've always wanted to own a basketball team, but I can't go out and buy the Miami Heat. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to succeed. I think what you said regarding collaborations, and I guess Ms. Cassell knows a little more than me about your expertise in a certain class or a program you would like to, to offer, I think that's fabulous. But to me, I'm looking forward to the charrette next week mm -hmm. to hear what our community wants and go from there. I think it's a first step. I hope you participate in that uh, and partner 
with anything in the future. And as Mr. Boylston said, uh, I would expect an RFP or, or something to come out from the city. But I think it's very clear to me we all have one goal. We want Old School Square open for business. However, no one has, <laughs> we can't figure out which way to go. Who's got the idea to do this? It's, I think it's become very clear to me at least, and hopefully some of my colleagues, what a complex place this is. And aside from, you know, mistakes and, and whatnot, and I'm not going there, it, it, a lot of volunteer hours were, were gotten, a lot of dollars were donated, a lot of sweat was done. It, it, it's, not, it's very complex. So to me, I'm looking forward to seeing the results of the charrette, the public charrette next week. Again, I hope you both participate. It's good to see you both. And uh, I thank you for the presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Could I just uh, thank you um, um, to uh, Mr. Moore because uh, Commissioner Boylston had talked about our um, nonprofit partners. Did you receive letters from individuals? I mean, this is not, it didn't work out how you had anticipated. It's not, we're having more trouble doing something there than we expected. It's not that easy to just go in. We're asking people to donate their time and en energy. I talked to the nonprofits. Uh, one is not at all interested, doesn't want to donate the time to going in there and putting something in. Another said, would love to, has great ideas, but we would have to fund it with a staffing individual. There are a lot of factors. We're almost to the end of the summer, and we don't even have a plan. And you're right. It's complex, and it needs a professional. I mean, you know, Delray Beach was very different 20 years ago. There were only a few restaurants. Pineapple Grove didn't even exist. Today, Atlantic Avenue is bristling with activity seven days a week. We have luxury hotels. We have top-of-the-line restaurants, one with a Michelin chef. We are soon, hopefully, Missy, to be part of the very exclusive blue flag program designation for our beach. We should have a cultural arts facility in the gateway of our city that is top-of-the-line. Old School Square Campus must be functional. It must showcase the best of Delray. So we have an opportunity with the Boca Museum. And listen, it may not be exactly what you want, but we don't have any other ideas. And I'm not opposed to having the charrette to see what people want to bring to the table, because I think ideas are great, and I think the museum will be very open-minded if we negotiate with them. But we, regardless of what the ideas are, we still need someone in there to implement them. We do not have that. So, I mean, look at the museum's accomplishments. I listed them out. There was a full-page ad in the Wall Street Journal, which is a review of the current exhibit, Art of the Hollywood Backdrop. That exhibit's there now, and I suggest everyone go see it. Discover the Palm Beaches estimates that the Machu Picchu exhibit, and that was one of those that you talked about in experience, um, went from October 2021 to March of 2022 and resulted in a direct spend of $22 million in Palm Beach County with a total economic impact exceeding $30 million. It generated $1 million in local tax support for Boca, which benefited the retailers. 150,000 people enjoyed that exhibit, including my husband and my daughter. Um, the exhibitions at the Boca Museum have received nationwide recognition and coverage in over 750 national news stories. Wall Street Journal, Associated Press, New York Post, Hollywood Reporter, The London Times, I, I, it's you know I don't understand why you, we would not be considering them for a contract to run the museum and look at what they can do in the school. They are a proven entity. The Boca Museum could not only create an environment that is self-sustaining, financially self-sustaining, but even profitable for the city. We have an opportunity to make Old School Square a world-class cultural arts facility. Our residents deserve it. And look, we're working on the tourism task force. 
Our visitors deserve it. Um, if I may. Before, before, just one more thing. I agree with you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. You're fighting hard, and I'm there. Thank you. I just think we need to have a little bit more uh, collaboration, my favorite word. So let's just say we're collaborating now. Okay, I so, think we've got another so partner. I, 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 that's exactly where I was yeah, going, um, Commissioner. I, I think that uh, collaboration is the, is the key here. We don't want to lose our hometown feel at the same time. We want to step it up, uh, elevate um, what can be had on campus. You know, I look at, um, and I think I explained this to Mr. Moore last time I was speaking with you about this, because I was asking what is this really going to mean on this agenda. But I look at um, <clears throat> Boca Museum, and I remember them just being on Palmetto Park Road, and it was kind of like a forgotten place, unless your grandmother used to take you when you were younger, as, as um, I know Vice Mayor explained to us. And and then them opening up at the end of a, um, of a, of a, pretty much a restaurant and, and, and retail district um, in, in Meisner Park. Um, they don't, run, by the way, run their, uh, the, uh, the outdoor space, which is the amphitheater. They just run the museum itself. And I look at the success that they've had there, and I think to myself, we have doors that open up to a much busier district, a much busier street. Why? couldn't we have at least that, if not more? And I think that we, we have to believe that we can um, in order to be able to get to that point. And I believe that we can. And I believe that we can have that with not losing what Delray is all about, which is that feel that we have as far as our hometown. This is our hometown campus. And I think that Miss Lawrence and her, her son, Mr. Stinson, would be an absolute asset to helping and working with that. As far as the comment about if we have to work with Boca Raton Museum, I think that there's a professional here that understands how to run an organization like a museum, and there is somebody who wants to come in and um, run it maybe, uh, but doesn't have that experience, and that's where I have to tell you, I'm with Ms. Cassell in drawing the line. I can't risk that. We are in a situation where we have to be successful. I mean, we really do. We, we had a long stint with one group that was um, delivering to a, to a degree um, in some respects, falling short in others, but delivering to a degree. Um, and we have to make sure that we are able to at least come to that level, if not raise it, because we have the opportunity right now of raising that level, and I think that it's important for us to do that. May I say that when I met with the museum, mm -hmm. they specifically told me they were not interested yeah. in the pavilion, nor were they interested in the field house. So I think this partnership is a win-win, and I see no one, no other organization coming forward saying we're interested in activating. Well, I, I think that what we should do is take it a step further and let Mr. Moore or mm. or Miss Jellen, um, you know, I would have prefer Miss Jellen because have conversations I, I moving think forward and bring it back to us again. Because truthfully, yeah. I, I I would have to tell you that I. Am okay with it, but I think that we need to make sure that we understand because, again, I think Miss um, Lawrence mentioned it. They're not here, but they weren't invited here. You know what I'm saying? I, I think that this was really kind of Miss Lawrence's and her son's, you know, opportunity to present because they didn't get that opportunity when they thought they were going to have it. So they have the opportunity today, and we heard a tremendous number of things that they can do. However, I don't know how that would you know, coordinate together and how that would work. I, I can't, exp you know, I, I'm not, I'm not able to do that. So if you want to say something, go right ahead. I have a question. Can I ask a question? Yeah. As a point of order, I uh, brought up last week to your assistant, Kelly, who did a great job. Um, as a point of order, this was a voted on agenda item. It was defeated three to two. It's my understanding per Robert rules or our rules or some rules. If it's an agenda item, it's voted on. I know you're going to look at it earlier because we did discuss it. I was curious what your research found. So technically, and I apologize for my voice again, <laughs> um, the prevailing party would have to bring back a motion for reconsideration at the next meeting. Obviously, we're well past that. <clears throat> I did watch. I was watching the meeting last week, and I did rewatch it again today. 
You know, I, I don't know if it's a true reconsideration. I think it's more of a hybrid. So there is some differentiation. You know, at the end of the day, I think there was consensus from three people, one of whom was on the prevailing party to move this forward. You know, so we're here. Um, I, I do have some concerns, though. I'm going to be very candid with all of you um, as to how this is being brought forward. Your job is to give staff clear direction, right? Mm -hmm. You're the policy makers. And so the clear direction was we want a charrette, mm -hmm. we want all the nonprofits to come to the charrette, and we want you to bring back a plan. Mm -hmm. And from that plan, we're going to make these decisions as to what to do with that property. And I think, um, you know, the mother, the visual adjectives, I think they got the direction, right? Because they were prepared to come forward to the charrette, which I thought was this week. I, I think it's this it's Thursday. Next week, it's the 23rd. Next, sorry, I'm, I'm on Alaska time. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think that as well intentioned as it was to bring this presentation, and I'm glad that it was brought to you, you know, I don't know if this was the right form and the right timing. Typically, um, artistic services are exempt from our purchasing code. So if the city manager felt that it was something that was worthy of your consideration, he would have had the ability to negotiate it, place it as a regular agenda item and had a little more consistency as to what's being brought to you. I think visual adjectives, what they brought forward, they termed as a proposal, but I think that based on the conversation that we're hearing, you know, the proposal would have to be tweaked, right? Because I don't think that there's a consensus for the entire property. And it brings into, you know, the Boca Museum of Art that we're not entirely sure if they want to do business with the city, right? I think they were very clear at the last you know, based on conversations with with Mr. Moore and some of the commission, that you know they they didn't necessarily want to do business with the city under the terms that we had proposed based on the vote that was taken. So, I think if you want my two cents, and I'm happy to do what the whatever the consensus of the commission is, I think that we should move forward with the charrette, mm -hmm. give you guys a plan, and that plan may very well include what visual adjectives can offer for the city. It might very well include what Boca Museum of Art brings. It might include another nonprofit. But I think that I, I think that part of the issue arises because this is such a unique property with so many different characteristics within each piece of it. You really do need to have a very solid plan to move forward. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I, I you know we don't want to fail. We got to get it right the first time. And I think what was working before with one entity managing the whole thing, I think you three of you at least were very clear that that wasn't working for you. And so to bring that forward again may not be the best idea. It might be better to break it up into four or five pieces and have something and have different agreements with maybe somebody from city staff being the property manager to, to, to make that realization come forward. So that's my opinion. I will do whatever you tell me to. If you want me to negotiate agreements, I'm happy to do so based on whatever the consensus is. Well, I would like to go with the, the recommendation that um, that you really just detailed there, but also that staff outlined for me just yesterday, which was to continue working with uh, with our partners, putting kind of a plan, a plan together, coming back to us, having the public charrettes. Maybe it's not one, maybe it's actually two public charrettes, maybe, you know, um, so that people can actually, in, you know, ensure that they give their input. Um, and then, I think an RFP process is the most transparent way to go. If, if Boca Museum is, is involved, they'll be there. They didn't put in for the last uh, RFP. So then how, are, how is all of this happening? I mean, I got side blind. I've, I never had a conversation with Boca, and then all of a sudden there's an agreement on our agenda. How does that happen? Then we vote on it. Then we voted down. Then all of a sudden it's reconsidered. Now all of a sudden it has three votes because um, you know a, another a small business is, is, is getting pressured to partner with them, and now we're going to reconsider that and move. Oh, it's I cannot be in favor of that process. Could I be in favor of one of these entities? Absolutely. If we go through the proper process, which staff outlined for me yesterday, going through the proper process, getting input from the community, working with our cultural partners, being absolutely transparent of what we're looking for, and not piecemealing this. I think we really should be looking out for someone to come in and run the whole campus. And if that means partnerships come forward, and, and a lot, many times in RFPs, that's what comes forward. There's an architect, there's a contractor. Partnerships come forward. I got an email just the other day from the head of Kravis saying how heartbroken 
how heartbroken she is and um, and reached out. However, I can help your help your city. There's a large art and cultural network in our counties. I spoke with someone at the cultural council. You know, they're they're willing to help, but we first have to identify what is it we're looking for, and then put that out for RFP and look at the presentations. Yeah. Yeah. That's the proper transparent way to do this. Let's go to Vice Mayor and then Debbie, and then Thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm glad you brought up our cultural partners because last week at the TDC, TDC meeting, I spoke to Dave Lawrence. Dave Lawrence is the president of CEO of the Palm Beach County Cultural Council. He will be in attendance next week. Uh, he has been uh, watching what's going on and whatnot and will be uh, at the charrette next week. And I think, you know, we all have ideas, what we want, what we want to see, what we want to do. We need an expert. <laughs> He's an expert. Now, if you got another expert, I, I would invite him, bring him. There's certainly a lot of people that know more about the arts than I do. I can go look at things and think they're nice, but I can't put together a show. No. So I think what you state, Mr. Boylston, I totally agree, work with our cultural partners, work with the experts, uh, and get them involved. And I'm happy Mr. Lawrence is coming. I, I did meet the new head of Kravitz, she's a very nice lady. Maybe she can come, maybe can extend an invitation to her. But we have cultural uh, uh, heavyweights yeah. in Palm Beach County, and they really haven't been involved through no fault of anyone. But I can tell you Mr. Lawrence will be there next week, and uh, I would urge my colleagues to invite any other cultural uh, individuals in our county to come participate and in our city. Yeah, and I'll just, I'll just mention that. I know there's like this urgency right now, but man, I was trying to get a workshop to discuss the plan for Old School Square for months. I got denied over and over and over again. It only took one request last week to have this discussion. I said, yeah, you want to have a discussion? I would never deny my colleagues having a discussion. I asked over and over and over again, can we have a workshop? Can we talk about a plan? What are we going to do? Denied, denied, denied for like six, seven months. And now there's urgency? I think there's always I, I been... Would I think there's always been urgency, yep. you know, because it's empty. And right now, I mean, I'm told the AC is not working in one building. There's roaches. It's there's problems. And if we don't take care of our property, but the problem is we don't, you know, if we go out for a grant, is that going to take a couple of years before any work will be done in there to we fix the inside? That That's not an option wait that long exactly and we don't have the money and some of these i think as i recall originally with the conversation with boca museum if it's a the working arrangements work then the money will you know there will be access to funding to get the work done and i and i want to say i don't really appreciate the characterization that someone's pressuring them they're asking for an opportunity in an area that that they don't have experience it would be wrong to say, yes, take over the whole facility. It's not wrong to say, are you amenable to doing what's in your area of expertise and working with others? That's not pressuring someone. As, as you partner okay, so with my selected organization. I don't have a selected organization. It's the city of Delray Beach. What is in their best? These aren't people that support elections. That's an unfair statement, Ryan. The people in Old School Square before were the people that supported elections. The Boca Museum doesn't run candidates. They don't have PACs. They don't support elections. So don't say my. It's not my. It's what's best for the residents. Right now, the most valuable piece of city property is vacant. And it needs to be filled. I brought that up. Okay. I brought that up last well, time. But your, but your idea was to engage the local nonprofits. Not a bad idea. But it didn't pan out, and you can ask Mr. Weeks. Moore. Four meetings, we're they've so had four meetings, and it failed. So here, here's the what deal. Failed. We're gonna, we're gonna have this. This is the discussion. I think that would be better set for the, um, for the, for the town hall or the, or, you right. know, when we're, when we're talking about it or the, what's it called? I'm sorry. It's a charrette workshop. Charette, Thursday, sorry. June twenty third, six o'clock at the so, field house. But, but um, Commissioner Johnson was um, actually in front of others. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Mayor. I think we've been working on this for almost a year. We put an outreach out immediately. In my opinion, we were a little, um, I hate to use my terms, I don't can use that word term. We were a little premature. Um, you, Commissioner Boylston, was, were in favor of having 
a community input. There was so much rancor from the previous tenants that we, I feel, a lot of our nonprofits were intimidated. We have a lawsuit, and I keep saying we better be careful what we say. It will be used against you. So hurling accusations back and forth, we couldn't have an open forum because of the rancor that was brought on by the previous tenants. And I was not in favor of going out to the nonprofits because I felt what happened would be what would happen. No nonprofit wanted to stick their toes in the water because of the animosity and the uh, recriminations that were being hurled at our in our direction and are still being hurled because the lawsuit's still there. We could not move forward because of it. Nobody wanted to touch us. All of the people that you're now saying are coming forward, uh, the cultural arts and their expertise in the Kravitz Center, I don't know if they came. And I, if they did come, they did not give us any input. They backed away, which I would think would be the smart thing to do when we didn't even know if the previous owners, or occupants rather, were even going to be allowed to stay. Now, they've gone on about their business. They also have the right to present themselves at this charrette. I think we finally came together and say, there's such rancor to have community input. Mm -hmm. We're going to have it. In the meantime, we have organizations who have finally come forward and want to do something. I did not uh, vote for the Boca Museum because of the way it was presented to me. I will say that in all honesty. It was rather um, cumbersome, ill-advised, ill... They just were kind of thrown at me, and I did not understand exactly what they were offering. Mm. And, but I'm willing to look at them again. They were courageous enough to come forward and say, let's do this. And I have heard from citizens who are in much favor of having them come. I'm always open for a, a new look-see. They, along with the Art and Culture Society, are the only two nonprofits in my awareness who have come forward and had the bravery to say, I don't care what, those other, what that other nonprofit said, did, whatever. I'm willing to come forward and present. But I had difficulty getting the Art and Culture Society in front of the group. I didn't know any other way to do it except to keep asking. So that's where we are. I'm willing to work with whomever wants to come forward. If now we have the Kravitz Center and this one and that one, who wants to come forward, all well and good. I applaud you. The fear is still palatable in our local community and our nonprofits are busy with their own programs. Mm -hmm. Some are being told we're not interested. So I think we need to do a little bit of this and a little bit of that and it's gonna take time for us to work our way back to a position. We cannot, however, do that if our uh, site is unkept, unclean and needs lots of repair. Absolutely. I too heard about the broken air conditioner. Yeah. Who wants to come into a building where the air conditioner isn't working? Why is that so? Who wants to come into a building where there are roaches? May I ask a question? Well, let me, let me go to Mr. Moore. You had your Thank you. Raised. No, just to clarify a couple of points and pretty consistent and congruent with what City Attorney Len Jellin talked about. So direction being offered for the June 3rd charrette workshop. I provided a summary to this effect via last Friday's information letter report in terms of how that will work, how that will be facilitated and outlined. Just to reiterate, the focus is for the long term. Mm -hmm. The long term vision and direction for the old school square campus number one in which various stakeholders, entities, interested parties will be welcome to participate. We're doing well to market that as much as we possibly can. Because above and beyond the conversations that are taking place this evening, it is necessary to achieve a long term course of direction and vision that should not change and we are preparing quite well to facilitate a nice exercise to that effect June 23rd, 6 o'clock p.m. at the Fieldhouse at Old School Square. Also, just to clarify, one of the ideas we discussed during a May 17th workshop meeting was the prospect of some 
opportunity for initial short-term programming in the coming months with respect to local artists coming together to utilize the Cornell Art Museum with respect to where we are and to go from there. And the consensus of nonprofit, the artistic cultural community based here in Delray Beach, Florida, is that we take our time because museum court curation, art curation is a timely process. So we need to be timely in that regard in terms of getting ourselves squared away to that effect. We've even come up with a working title of what such an initiative would be, Kaleidoscope from the Eyes of Artists at the Cornell Museum as a working initiative to that effect. And so being that we did sit down, take time and listen to leadership and representatives from the artist community, the cultural community, and that the advice was that that takes time to get work in that manner. So that was the outcome to that effect. Likewise, there won't be any immediate activities to that effect because we listened closely to the artistic community, the cultural community, and took that advice to heart, and so here we are. Likewise, to reiterate, long-term focus would be the basis for the June 23rd Jurette workshop exercise, number one. Number two, whatever opportunities for short-term considerations would have to be touched as part of that process as well. And we need to do as much as we possibly can to keep communication open and tight. And that process will begin as soon as the month of July at either of the upcoming regular city commission meetings at that time. First, beginning with the results of the 20, June 23rd Charette workshop exercise with specific outcomes to that effect and whatever other conversations that can be held between now and then or whatever the case might be. That's fantastic. And again, in my conversations with the Boca Raton Museum of Art, their interest is a long-term focus. I have to point that out, and that is where we all are. Great. If I may, my, my understanding, though, is that you've had numerous meetings with respect to the Cornell, and they've not been, if I may, fruitful. Just summarize the course of where we right, are but in But people are telling me that it's... Wait, the Cornell? Numerous meetings with the Cornell? Who's that? The, that's meetings? what I was talking about. To discuss the Cornell, oh, oh, okay. and they've not been fruitful. Could I make, ask a question? Would it be, uh, why don't we have the charrette and have you, would it be okay? To, I'd like to make a motion to have you continue to discuss with visual adjectives. And I mean, in the manner that we talked about, the class they want to teach, the two outdoor events. Planning requires a lot of time. Nothing's happening in the short term, but nothing's going to happen in the long term unless we get going. And then direction as well, that's my motion, to talk to the Boca Museum because regardless of what this charrette provides for what we want to see in the museum, what type of classes we want to see, what type of shows we want to see, we, the facility is what it is. It's not operational. It is a museum. It is a school, it's a field house, it's a, an outdoor venue, and it's an indoor theater. So I think we are working with what we're working with, and whatever the sh charrette brings forth, it will give us ideas as to how the management can move forward. But we're not, right now we're doing nothing. It's not, okay. it's and not so true. wait a second, would you, you have a motion? Did you My say? motion is that we, Move and negotiate with the Boca Museum long term. Negotiate with visual visual adjectives. Pardon me, I'm, I apologize. And that we still continue forth with the charrette. Okay. This is a presentation. Do we have a before we go? Do we have a second or not? Second. Okay. And Thank so you. may I uh, just step in for a second? I'm sorry. Can we even second that? This is a presentation. We're making. You, you can. Oh, I you think we motion. can. You can make a motion. But, so may I make a suggestion? Instead of saying negotiate, can we instead um, reach out for more information? And the reason I say that is because I don't, we don't know where anybody is. And so it's really I'll amend my motion as directed. OK. Uh, are you OK? Second. OK. And the, OK, yes, you, I, I, I see <laughs> our city, city attorney talk. So I make. guess uh, from my perspective, the concern is. Can you adjust your? I, I know your voice is, is yeah, there you is go. That, so I guess the concern is, is that if, if we're going to engage in these discussions, then are, are, we're not going to do an RFP in the future because I think we need to be careful that 
we're in, engaging these companies who admittedly want a long-term relationship. No one's gonna come here for less than a year, let's be honest. And so by doing that, you're gonna be limiting your RFP. And in the event that you decide not to do an RFP, some of these people might be disqualified, right? Because they're bringing things forward to you, kind of unsolicited, and then we can't tailor an RFP so around what they're presenting to you because it's gonna look like we're tailoring the, tailoring the RFP. So I think we just need to be careful. Um, there's nothing that prohibits Mr. Moore from engaging in a conversation. That, that's always his prerogative. This is, you know, however, I just, I, I'm just gonna be very clear about this. The direction has to be clear to staff. If we're actually gonna do a charrette, I think we need to have the, the tables cleared, bring everything forward. You don't wanna discourage people that are gonna say, you know what, uh, you know, I wanted to have the field house too, but since they're already giving it to this other entity, now I can't come, I don't wanna come forward, why waste my time? You wanna have all the options open. And like the saying goes, the cream always rises to the top. So if someone's really meant to be there, they're they're gonna you know they're gonna win you over. But I just think that if, if you want to go down this path, then I don't see the purpose in the charrette because. Okay. Well, let me ask a question because maybe I'm misunderstanding, um, and this this might be where rubber meets the road for all of us. The charrette is going to determine how we move forward with the entire grounds, or the shred is for the community to tell us what they want to see on the grounds. I thought it was that they wanted what they want to see on the grounds, and then we take that to determine, is it better to do, do, divide it up? Is it better to have one head and then and overall? I mean, that's what I thought. I didn't think that the charrette was to have people come in and say, well, I want to do it, or I want those people over there to do it. Uh, They're going to come in and, and bring you ideas, right? But a nonprofit's right? going to come in telling you what their idea is and you know, provide that as, as a suggestion for the commission. So I mean, there's no reason why we couldn't go along with those suggestions. Nobody's asking anybody to make a decision here tonight other than just to make sure that we can follow up and find out what it is that would potentially work. If there's no really good suggestion coming out of that charrette that's different from what we're standing with, we'll be that much further along to really kind of, you know, talk about where we go from here. I, I the agree. place is dead. I think that the concern was negotiating anything. Yeah, well, I think it was I, I pulled think off. conversations are okay. Candidly, they're not gonna be brought back to, to you before the next meeting, which right, the charrette exactly. will have already taken place. But I just think that, if you're ultimately gonna go down the path of an RFP, I think in an abundance of caution, you need to, number one, keep an open mind okay. and remain transparent. And let me just say, we've gone down that path and we got zero, okay, out of it, zero. And one well, of the reasons why is because of the fact that it was it was somewhat tainted with the, you know, hey, what are you gonna do about the lawsuit that was filed last night? Um, so that did happen. So I don't see that as being viable, and that was some, so we're gonna spend another eight months or, or four months or whatever to get to that point to find out that nobody's interested again. We have viable people that have come forward, and that's the thing that's different that steps, you know, push, pushes this apart for me because we didn't have that before. May I add also? to that? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. It's worth noting that the Boca Museum went and spent a fair amount of time with all of our nonprofits, took advisement for from them, and discussed that they would work with them. That's if we're doing the charrette for our nonprofits to talk about wanting to partner. Well, they already have somebody who said they would partner with them, and that's the Boca Museum. Mayor, um, yes. Um, did, are you finished? <clears throat> that yes. wasn't in the agreement. What, what agreement? agreement? The agreement that was brought before us. You, you know, we keep mentioning that they'll, they'll reach out to do this and they'll do this and they'll raise money and they want. None of that was in the agreement. And that's a real problem I had is the agreement didn't seem like it was written by us with a set line of parameters of what we're looking for in a partner. Mm -hmm. It really looked like it was written by the other side. You'll write a check for this amount, you'll put this amount into the building, you'll hand over the keys for this amount of time. And then all those other things were said when I met with them and you continue to repeat them, but they weren't in the agreement going through the RFP process, that's when you line all those things out. And I'll just remind everybody here that we just had a lot of interest in the golf course project, right? We had letters of interest, and what did we decide to do? Go to RFP. Even though we knew we had interest and we had people coming I mean, forward, just to. like we do now. We had two contracts. We we well, regardless if we have to or not, that's the proper process. 
right? Is to go out to well, our, we did that. Go out to we RFP. did that with the, with the with the but, with the but we didn't. It was it was rushed out, and it did not have any of the zero public engagement. As a matter of fact, that RFP went out without one conversation up here in regards to the old school square campus or topic, let alone with the public. I'd like to correct you. It was not an RFP. It was not an RFP. I don't know the it was title. An invitation, invitation to, to negotiate. Invitation to, right. negotiate. Invitation to negotiate. negotiate. Sorry. Invitation you're to right. negotiate. We have a difference. Right. There was an invitation to negotiate. There was so we didn't even no go out with a interest. Zero. Zero. Right. Interest. So we didn't even go out with an actual RFP. You're absolutely right, Commissioner Johnson. And uh, and now here's the process to it. This is. This is about being transparent, and I don't want to go back and forth anymore because you know what? We have so many other things to worry about in this city, and we've created this huge issue when we well, should be focusing on so many other I th things. I don't think we created but, the issue. No, the lack me, of reporting we, was um, a, a problem for me. Okay. I'm sorry, but I'm not going backwards. Attorney Jellin, I have a question for you. You indicated that um, you didn't want to be having us say negotiate if we're going out for an RFP. Do we have to go out for an RFP? If we said today, if I make a motion today to negotiate with the Boca Museum, including that they would incorporate a co cooperative relationship, and I don't know how you characterize word define or put that into a contract, also engage with visual adjectives. Could I make that motion today, knowing that as a result of the last rejection, they're more concerned about uh, us long term, rightfully so, and they're looking for a longer term contract. Could I make a, that motion here today? Yes. Okay, that is my motion. I motion that we encourage Attorney Jellin and our city manager Jellin. to negotiate with the Boca Museum for a long-term arrangement, factoring in that it's critically important to the residents of Delray Beach and this commission that our non-profits are factored into this. And look, the, the goal is we don't wanna lose our history. We don't wanna lose our character. We're in the middle of a That's what this is about. And, and also motion. negotiate with visual adjectives. That is my motion. It's lengthy. So you withdrew the other motion? Yes, that's correct. I withdraw my original Second. motion. I'd like to discuss. Okay. You said something very important. You said it's important to our residents. Right. 15,000 people signed a petition that didn't agree with you. But forget about that, because I agree we should go forward. We have a charrette lined up next week. <laughs> As Mr. Boylston said earlier, it's been, a, it's been very difficult to schedule that and get it set. One other thing Mr. Boylston brought up, I, I think went kind of quick, with the golf course. What did the golf course people do? We had meetings at the golf course and spoke to the people there. We have not spoken to the residents or we have ignored the residents. Now, if there is direction or uh, a sense in that, for you to have the city manager or the city attorney speak to these nice people, that's great. But you said important to the residents. You've ignored, it's, the residents have been ignored, period. Overwhelmingly. They haven't had a, to talk to, uh, a chance to public comment many times. May I reply? So I, I can't support that. If, the, if the city attorney and the city manager want to speak to a, a museum that was voted down three to two for the record, and we have a group of, of Michelle and Edward who are very nice and are very good at literary, but they even stated they, they want to, if they're forced to work with Boca, they'll be, do it, and they have a lot of great ideas. My point is this. It's important to listen to the residents. Next Thursday, we're going to listen to them. Now, after that, we'll see what happens, but to, to ignore the residents again and go forward on this, I just think is, is down a bad path and I can't support it. Deputy I, Vice Mayor. If you, I may, I understand that, but I will say to you is, that, um, yes, thank you, sir. The an email that garnered those uh, signatures was untruth and false in its initial uh, email on August 10th. So I, I've talked to a lot of residents. I responded to over 300 emails and I'm telling you there is over Overwhelming support for the Boca Museum in Delray Beach. Overwhelming. Okay, so um, we. Let's go. 
All right, let's, let, we gotta wrap we gotta it up this somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. For wrapping it up. Uh, there is nothing to say that we will not listen to whatever the residents say next Thursday, is it? Yes. We're not gonna meet before then. There's not gonna be an agreement. We're just asking them to go forward and talk to these two brave nonprofits who've come forward with some thoughts. I don't know how the charrette's gonna go. I, I, and selected organizations. I was beg your pardon? And selected organizations. Cancel out. And selected organizations. And selected organizations. Well, this is an organization that you asked to come forward. Then there's an organization that Ms. Cassell had a lot of conversations with. And anyone with. other now, could have come forward and made together. the same request mm -hmm. to present to us at the charrette, which is only going to be two hours. That's I right. don't know if they're going to have enough time to, if there are five or six to come forward, we can it's going to be that half the time of it. So I'm happy that they had this opportunity to present who they are and what they're going to offer. I was a little concerned about what the Boca Museum came forward. And again, there was a little, a lot of miscommunication, I think, in the way they were brought on board and what their anticipation was expectations we never said anything about a two-year or three-year term but if that was what the agreement was going to be I was not in favor of it at that time I am in favor of revisiting with this organization because they did have the courage to come forward in spite of the fact that we are under a lawsuit situation okay. so that's that's asking a lot because we don't um, know how the judge's gonna Okay. Just one so other thing. I, I did I not hand select anybody to yeah, appear I, here. I don't, that's right. not appropriate to say. They were brought here by the city manager. They interviewed with me and I spoke to Mr. Lippman apologizing to him after that meeting. And I'm going to add to that. And I, after the city commission asked Mr. Mr. Um, Moore to go out there and try to find somebody. That was our direction to you. So that's how they, that's how that is the correct. museum was procured. There was nobody up on this dais that was going to Boca Museum, museum and asking them, please come to our city and, and offer something. That didn't happen right. that way. And they're qualified so and experienced was, was, yeah. and knowledgeable. Okay. So we're, I think we're done. Don't yeah. you think? So, okay, so we have a motion roll. and a second. Madam Clerk, what, what's the motion, please? I can repeat it more I, I, with more clarity. I, I asked Madam Clerk. Madam Clerk, what's the motion? I'll do my best. Um, motion was made by Deputy Vice Mayor uh, Cassell to direct uh, City Attorney Jellin and City Manager Moore to negotiate with Boca Museum and visual adjectives for a long term arrangement that our nonprofits are factored in. And then you went into Sorry. a little bit more mm -hmm. so I didn't get the rest of that I think you got the gist of it be great if that was okay. an RFP so um, call the roll please mr. Boylston no. miss Johnson yes mayor Petrolia yes mr. Frankel the residents no miss Cassell yes thank you okay madam mayor yes. and ladies and gentlemen if I made to summarize so we will proceed as best as we possibly can in terms of follow-up engagement with the Boca Raton Museum of Art as well as visual adjectives over the coming weeks. <laughs> this is not an overnight proposition because of course we will still proceed mm -hmm. with the June 23rd charrette process and again if we have to go up beyond a couple hours to get some outcomes to that effect, I'm looking forward to offering a comprehensive update on all fronts as best as we can during a meeting in July. I'm looking forward to a brief update to this effect in writing in the next couple of weeks as to how this is to all be facilitated and handled. And from there, we will look forward to moving on. So again, long-term considerations are the focus and we will path the course forward as best as we possibly can. Okay, very good. And so, and may, I, may I just ask, can we have some kind of plan as to what we're going to do on that campus? Because, well, I mean, I think that we need to wait to have the charrette. Let 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 that come back to us, and I think that's going to answer a lot of as long as it's going to happen because okay. the grass is awful and all the rest. So yeah. thank you. You got it. I'll firm this up in writing via the July 1st information letter report. But right now, I'm contemplating by July 19th, we'll be able to summarize the experiences and events of the direction having been outlined, to include and I reemphasize an opportunity for the public to participate in a charrette workshop exercise Thursday, June 23rd. 2022, 6 p.m. 
Are you finished with your um, your comments and your? I am. Okay, so we're moving on to public comments. So anybody would like to speak at public comments, please line up, queue up. You will have uh, three minutes. Make sure that you um, state your name and your address, and um, and then you'll have three minutes. Do we start now? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Yes, you may. Okay, great. Yes, um, my name is Lori J. Durant, and I live at 4165 Northwest 10th Street, uh, Delray Beach, Florida. I am a lifelong resident of Delray Beach, born and raised here. And I am here to express my support for the Boca Raton Museum of Art operating um, the Old School Square campus or aspects of it, the Cornell Museum and eventually the Crest Theater. I do know that the Parks and Rec uh, Department uh, seamlessly took over the activation of the, the pavilion mm -hmm. and the field house and just with my interactions with them for other events um, that I was um, contemplating, um, they were very responsive. They got back to you the same day. They were extremely efficient, and I found that to be very refreshing. Um, so, if Parks and Rec is comfortable with it, you know I'm comfortable with it um, as a citizen. But I do feel that the Boca Raton Museum of Art has the um, the expertise as well as the financial endowment to hit the ground running with operating that campus and serving as the umbrella and and giving it a a delray beach feel if you will so yes they are in another city they are in boca but delray beach has sister cities in japan in haiti in italy and we welcome them as the all america city so why can't we as the all america city welcome people in our neighboring city of boca raton we can't have it both ways and say, when you come from a foreign country, we'll roll out the red carpet for you, but we have an issue because you are Boca. Half their members and donors live in this city. They have the expertise to give the Cornell Museum and eventually the Crest Theater its own original flavor and feel. So let's take advantage of that for the greater good of the city and the mission of that um, cultural arts center. And as a lifelong resident of Delray Beach, I will avail myself to work with the Boca Raton Museum with local programming and outreach to the local communities. And since year 2004, I have been conducting uh, cultural bus tours and I would love to include the Cornell Museum once it is activated and if it's under the operation of the Boca Raton Museum of Art. Um, Taking over the management of a site like that, it's, it's a financial risk. Mm -hmm. And the Boca Raton Museum of Art is in a position where they can take on that kind of financial risk. It is not easy. You need to bring in content within both sites that will bring in an audience. When you bring in an audience, you will have the revenue to help with the operations of that. That takes some time, but you need an entity with a track record that can walk in there and hit the ground running. And so I support the Boca Raton Museum of Art. Thank you very much, Ms. Durant. You're welcome. I just wanted to mention something else, um, just because I, she, um, uh, Lori just brought something to my mind. Uh, I meant to mention this. Parks and Recreation, I, I, I just feel like, really deserves a huge um, pat on the back for what they have done on that campus. And, I, and I'm telling you, I was there this weekend from the Friday night, oh, well, I'm sorry, it was a something going on but anyway Saturday night concert Sunday we had uh, there was a, a, a there was a, um, a, a LBGTQ uh, gay festival going on down there they had it going I mean it was on fire and I and I'm telling you they really knew what they were doing so that from the bottom of my heart I appreciate what this this town has done to step in so thank you very much Lori you're welcome yes ma'am hello I'm B.J. Sklar, and I am with the Downtown Development Authority. My position with the DDA is the Visitor Information Center Coordinator. I just wanted to share some information based on the fact that you are doing a tourism marketing campaign, what we do. And so the Visitor Information Center here in Delray Beach is operational seven days a week from nine until five. I have 21 people that are all volunteers that are part of the visitor center. We have two shifts. 
that we have 14 volunteers that come in and they take a specific shift. We then have other volunteers who are on a call me if you need me basis. The volunteers, the prerequisite to be part of the visitor center is that you have to be a full-time resident. You have to have lived in this area for at least three years full-time. And they go through extensive training that I provide from four to five hours of exactly what they need to do in order to sell Delray Beach. Our mission statement is to keep everyone in Delray Beach. So when visitors are coming in, and we also, may I add, have a tremendous amount of residents that use our facility. To the tune of, in 2021, we saw almost 12,000 people walk in our door. Wow. Out of the 12,000, 2,300 were local downtown Delray Beach residents. So they are using our visitor center as well as our website and our social media platforms to find out information about what to do, where to live. Parents are coming in, grandparents are coming in, and they will use us as a tool, uh, the, both residents and the visitors. I also work with all of the hotels and make sure that their front office staff and concierge staff is trained about what is going on in our downtown. So we are constantly selling downtown Delray Beach first. We also provide information as needed with all of Delray Beach, whether it's sending them to Murakami, sending them to Wakota Hatchie, send them to Delray Beach Regional Park, but we are a visit Florida also tourism center. So we provide information as needed. So if someone comes in and asks for an airboat ride, I'm going to go ahead and share the information about where to go ahead and get it. But the mission statement of what we do is to share information to keep them in town using our restaurants and our retail stores and uh, sharing information about events. So I invite you all up uh, to come and see our visitor center. Uh, we are a well-oiled machine with tremendously wonderful people. Thank so, you, BJ. Thank you. And by the way, it's up there on the um, on the beach right next to the burger stand, um, and it is a refreshing little spot to walk into. And thank you very much for all that you do there. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I just want to forget. Yes, sir. Uh, good uh, evening, I guess. Good evening. Price Patton, 1020 Tamron Road. Um, I'm here to talk about the Boca Museum in a very narrow historical perspective. Um, you know, we met with them and our board, uh, our board voted unanimously to note that they would be excellent stewards uh, of the historic character, one of our most important cultural and historic buildings in Delray. They'd assured us that they, were, they, were, they weren't going to mess with the building at all, you know, and that was our concern. Also the grounds. The grounds are considered historic by the uh, Secretary of the Interior's standards and um, they would not be trying to plop down big different buildings outside. They do have some interesting um, light shows. They want to activate the grounds more um, and make it more inviting to residents and uh, visitors alike. Um, so we completely support them. We're glad they're still, still in the game. And um, that's what the Pres Preservation Trust, which is a 501c3 nonprofit that does not ask the city for money. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you very much, Price. <laughs> Hi. Yes, Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, Laura Simon with the Downtown Development Authority. And um, first, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about and thank BJ for her efforts at the Visitor Information Center and invite anyone who has um, relatives or has wants information about what's going on to always use that as a resource. Mm -hmm. um, but most of all, thank you for your time with the Tourism Master Plan conversation today at 3 o'clock. Um, it has been a, a big effort for us um, bringing everybody together to make that happen and uh, actually talk about tourism and the tourism economy that is we are a resort village by the sea and we want to make sure that you know it does not we that's what's you know saved us through the pandemic and we continue to work hard to to make sure that 
Uh, we are the number one destination in the state, in the county, um, and you know, eventually the country. We we have, we were getting lots of accolades through the press, which is fantastic. Um, but I also just want to share uh, as a follow up to our meeting that we had with Mr. Moore in collection with our. Um, nonprofits, um, the Spady Museum, the Arts Garage, the Arts Warehouse, and um, the you know just our the DDA as a collection to talk about how we can activate the space um, of the museum in a very fast manner. I think what we really need to make sure of, and that what we thought of, walked away from there, is yes, we want to do it. We felt really empowered and really excited to be able to do something there, and wanted to, and want to because it is such a integral part of our community and it uh, it is active um, thanks to the parks and rec team and others stepping up to activate that space however it is a museum and it is um, a, it has had investment to make it and it's a huge space and I have an expert on my team who ran it for six years who knows it ins and outs of that space and said hey stop because it's not ready mm -hmm. the space is not ready to walk into mm -hmm. you can't just walk in and put art on the wall and expect people to come it doesn't have lighting it doesn't have it just needs a lot of attention mm -hmm. and we let it as we need to give that that attention that the lighting from the track lighting is gone so there's no track lighting there's security cameras were ripped out of the walls the paints the walls are in disrepair or they need to be repaired the floors are um, you know need to be repaired because this, the stickers that were put in there for the six feet apart, which I don't know why we did that, but now the Day County Pine vine, uh, varnish is coming up. So there's really a lot of need that needs to be taken care of there before anybody can walk in there. And much less, you know, there's people that visit here. We spend a lot of money to get them here and then they walk up to the museum thinking that they can go there because the signs are still up. You know, there's an art exhibit, you know, and we have to do better than that now. And I think you know we're looking at how we can do that. So I just encourage everybody just to to look at the, the grounds and the museum and how we can, we can care for it right away. So thank, thank you. you. And I and I want to mention I think that uh, Laura Simon had mentioned uh, DDA director had mentioned to me in a meeting recently about putting a sign up in front that can redirect people to other areas and just say currently we're closed. Um, so that there is some sort of a, you know, a redirect, and I think that that's a really important thing. Yeah. So I hope that you will m proceed with the city manager. Yes, we're working on that. Yeah. Okay. So, great. Thank Thanks. you. With yes, QR codes. Good evening. Good evening. I promise, best behavior. I am speaking in reference to what's on the agenda, in reference to the proclamation of the observance of Name Juneteenth. Name and address first. Oh, you wonder who I am? Yes, Everybody knows me here. Does. Pamela Williams. I am both Pamela Williams and Tammy Taxpayer. I reside at 245 Northwest 8th Avenue. I am a lifetime uh, resident. I didn't come here. I'm from here. Mm -hmm. Now, with that being said, on the agenda tonight, we have a proclamation where you're going to have the observance of Juneteenth. I want to say I fully support that. Inclusion is everything. Gives me a third or fourth, if not sixth thing to be proud to be a part of being both a resident and an employee of the city of Delray Beach for 35 years. Now, I would like to see in the future, as early as the 20th, city hall being closed and employees being given that day off. When a number of us made an inquiry into it, we were told that that would be something for the commission to bring forth and to one day vote on. And Scuttlebutt, I can't confirm where I got that from, states that it would probably come forth with us giving up a holiday mm -hmm. to obtain this one. Yeah, not for that. Yeah. Any additional ones, you know, will be greatly appreciated. And again, thank you all for appearing to the observance of Juneteenth, it being a federal ho uh, holiday. And, well, next year I won't be here to get it off, but hey, I'll be Tammy taxpayer and I'll have one day to complain about, I can't pay my water bill, can't get a hold of anybody. So thank you all so much for observing that. And yeah, we need to get that day off, maybe on the 20th of this month. I think that we, we talked about that before, and I think that there is a maximum number of days off you're allowed in a year. I think somebody had brought it up, and it was like you were either going to have to trade off one in order to be able to get that one. So it would be that situation. Yes. So there's a rule somewhere, Sam. You can only have X amount of, of 
Madam Mayor and ladies and gentlemen, that's something we will evaluate and I'll okay. be sure to do so accordingly as we prepare for 2023. And I think about the experiences, if I may, I had while serving as city manager of Sebastian, Florida, bringing board King Holiday as mm -hmm. a recognized mm -hmm. holiday. So a little bit of experience to that effect. And quite frankly, there is movement afoot at the federal level that will help the process yeah. outline. So I'm well aware and I will offer considerations as we go forward appropriately. There for the 20th. Thank, Thank you. you guys so much. You got it. Anyone else? Yep. Yes, sir. Yep. Yep. George Long, 46 North Swinton. I was at a uh, CRA meeting last week, and towards the end, you had a lot of discussion about alleys at the Northwest, Southwest neighborhood, <clears throat> excuse me, all this Osceola uh, Park area. And that inspired me to continue some research that I'm doing that I want to tell you about briefly so you know why I'm poking around for some records requests or stuff like that. I noticed when we looked at all these alleys that were being put in, nobody put a sidewalk in blocking access to the properties in the back. They encouraged access. And uh, I want to point out that sometimes if the very rare once in a lifetime event that if you did, actually did something in an alley to block access, um, it could be a big problem, particularly if you had a, say, a historic home in a commercial in an area that you were going to make into commercial, you wouldn't be able, you're not allowed to park in the front in a commercial property. You have to go to the back. And in some cases, you can't get to the back. So anyway, um, I've decided to uh, help the city uh, find a way to solve such a problem should it occur. Um, generously devoting my time. Um, and sometimes it could be just as simple as just giving a credit for some parking places, um, saving somebody maybe a $100,000 loss, which sounds like an exaggeration, um, could be handled as easy as that. Uh, but there's some really big hurdles that you, you would run across. One is the idea that the uh, LDRs don't have a provision for that specifically big deal um, and then sometimes the perception would be that the problem is not that bad you would look at it from the outside not knowing what's involved uh, and say well that's not a problem and then uh, there's also some very interesting legal concepts that wouldn't apply because of um, four-year statute of limitations on inverse condemnation lawsuits but if you ever wanted to take a look it, what might be behind a request like that. Some of the concepts, some of the fair decisions that have been made, look up inverse condemnation, impairment of access, and if you want a local example, look up <sighs> Palm Beach County versus Tesler, not the, not the car thing, T-E-S-S-L-E-R, Boca Tone, and it will explain all the various concepts involved in uh, what happens when you block access off of a property, not by eminent domain, a certain type of taking that that is. And then if you want to look at one, I don't really want you to look at, but I'll mention anyway to be fair, uh, look at Weir uh, versus Palm Beach County. That has to do with the property where 80, uh, Deck 84 is located now, years ago. Well, thank you, and I will do my best to help you resolve this. Thank you. For your benefit. Appreciate it. Anyone else? <laughs> yes, sir. James Quillian, 925 Southeast 2nd Avenue. I'm going to try to talk on two things really quickly. Um, in respects to the presentation that just went on previously, um, what we had before was untenable and it shouldn't have been allowed to continue for a long time. Thank God we had people with courage that would finally put a stop to that. What I'm seeing now from the commission is... Um, the work that's going to be involved in in fixing that and, and and selecting the right choice and it's like you know you know my humble opinion it's like uh you know the hardships that women have to go through to have a child they they have a child for nine months they do all the work and then they give birth to the child and they always say that there's no way a man could uh, uh carry children because they they can't handle the pain they can't do that work I, I tend to agree. And there's a lot of other things that men don't seem to know how to do well. Moving on to the next subject. A month and a half ago or so, we were here about doggy daycare. 
in our neighborhood. As I, I just trying to remember, there were like some people on the commission trying to give the keys to the city to the applicant that had been breaking the rules for two years. And then there were smarter people on the commission and the lawyers that were like, hey, 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 you have someone that's been breaking the rules for two years. Maybe we should have a parameter set up and rules and regulations and stuff like that. Okay, now we've moved on. They granted this uh, waiver or variance to the applicant. Now you have dogs again barking at 5 o'clock in the morning occasionally. Not all the time, but so what do I do now? As Because I get the, my wife gets the phone calls. James, what are you going to do? Okay, well, should I, you know, send the, the copies to certain commissioners? Should I call the police and then maybe they'll, have they, have they been told they can answer a noise complaint again? Or are they still on the thing that they can't answer the noise complaint? Will code enforcement do something now as opposed to before? I don't know because before I think we had gone back to the days of Al Jaquette where, where a commissioner maybe called certain departments in the city and was putting their finger on the scale of justice. Now, you know, what do I do in this situation? Because they're asking me. So now I'm asking you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Anyone? Nope. Seeing. Nope. Okay. Um, public comment is closed. Moving on to consent agenda. And there is an amendment to it. So is, we can get approval for that. Motion to approve the consent agenda as amended. Second. Call the roll, please. <clears throat> Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Okay, first item on consent agenda, I'm sorry, on regular agenda is going to be 7AA, which was originally 6I4, which is uh, resolution 92 22, removed by Mr. Cassell? Yeah, I just had a question. Um, did, did Is this number much higher than it was in the past? It is. A, it's actually a little bit higher. We scrutinized this during the agenda review setting meeting, and we do have rep leadership from Dairy Beach Fire Rescue to explain a little bit as to why that is. But yes, ma'am, I was a little bit concerned myself. Okay, thank you for Sir, that. Sir, please. So yes, it is. Uh, uh, Kevin Green, Assistant Chief, Fire Department. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, yes, this, uh, this cost is slightly higher than it has been in the past, but this was uh, um, an, an item that we felt was important for the uniforms. Our current vendor um, does not have a local brick and mortar store and we spend an, an extraordinary amount of time, staff does, trying to take care of uniform items and issues. And um, this current firm that we have proposed here, Design Lab, does have a brick and mortar store in West Palm Beach. Uh, Palm Beach County Fire Rescue actually has used them for over 10 years. And so we felt that this was a, a good thing to move towards and uh, would benefit the city as well because it would save time and energy of our staff. You mean for, sh I mean, so typically it would be, you'd place the order and it'd be shipped to you and now your gentleman will go up there and pick out the items? No, we, we can still place the items online, but we'll have a brick and mortar store that we could go to if there was an issue that needed, something need to be altered. Currently we would have to take it to another outside vendor. Um, and the, the current vendor, Gauls, um, is strictly online and uh, we spent a tremendous amount of time shipping uniform items back and forth and we've just had a, a, a great deal of difficulty with them. So Design Lab, again, they have a, a local store that we can uh, go to. Okay. We can meet with them and review items before making purchases as well. Chief, with all, if I, don't, if I may, uh, with all due respect, I, I, I mean, that didn't really answer the question of why it has climbed as high as it has. Um, it, it, it appears that um, this is a three-year contract, which would, when I was kind of figuring out, it was about $1,000 per person in the department per year to, for uniforms that obviously you don't throw out, I guess, after the first year. But that seems like a lot. And I personally was surprised, um, as obviously Commissioner Casal was, when I read this the first time around and, was, and did speak with um, Chief Tommy at the time about it. And he said that they are raising it um, even though your average is in the 300,000, 300 and change um, range, why we're at uh, half a million dollars for that contract. And I, I'm just going to be frank with you. I think that uh, I, I'd like to know what other uh, 
you know, surrounding areas are paying for their uniforms on a on an annual basis as well. To understand that that half million dollars is is um, is is a fair number. I I just find that to be just huge, and especially jumping from in the three hundred thousand dollar range to that range. I'm not sure that you've or the, or chief has said that it's going to cost any more. Um, you know, whether it's brick or mortar, or you're ordering it through. Um, to me, that's that's a huge jump, and. I can't support it. I mean, I, I, I'm surprised that, I mean, I'm, I'm glad you pulled that off because I forgot about it. But uh, that's, that's a lot of money. And I, I could support it if I know that that's normal. But because of the fact that we're not coming from that and we're moving to that, I would have to have at least some indicators that this is where the, you know, where everybody else is as well around us. So it is a normal uh, jump. I know there's a lot of cost for materials. Everything's gone up. But this is a big, huge jump. So, uh, and Mr. Moore, I think that, you know, this is this is your add on to the contract. Did you do any background checking on how much other uh, our, our neighboring communities are, are spending on their uniforms? On a whimsical basis, and it's fairly consistent, quite frankly. And again, I was, my interest was to engage in a much deeper dive, mm -hmm. truly analytically, in terms of what's happening in that regard. So there is some element of price increases in this realm. Again, my analysis was fairly whimsical because I was not able to get a lot of specific quantitative data to truly answer the question over the next few years. And therefore, I was looking to secure support from the Delray Beach Fire Rescue Leadership to help clarify accordingly. Is there a way that we, this is not time sensitive, correct? We have a little bit of time, I believe. So what I would suggest, given the concerns haven't been expressed, if there is an interest in having us to proceed in this regard, we will come back with a bit of a market analysis, if you will, so as to help the city commission to outline and understand exactly what the quantitative outcomes so that clarification and concerns can be alleviated. Thanks. I, I hope you're comfortable, because it is a quite a substantial increase. And typically, when you're doing a contract for the long term, there's a discount built in and there's that's but I'm sure you're excited about station 113 so this one. <laughs> no. yeah, yes I'm chairman sorry. if if that's going to be what we're going to do um during my recent station tour I was amazed by one I think I don't know if it's all of the stations or most of the stations they had saunas oh yeah and the reason why they have saunas is because after they go on a call they have to decontaminate and there's yeah. certain things they have to do so I, I would support getting that information from our, our neighbors, but I'd like to know on these 24-hour shifts these men and women do, how many times they have to change? I don't know the answer. I don't, know I, I don't need it tonight because we're going to bring it back, it sounds like, sure. but I, I think that's very important to have that information. Sure. Yeah. The, uh, the, the actual cost increase is approximately $30,000 a year um, over what we currently are budgeted for. So. Right. It, I know the 555,000 is, is a large number over the three years, but again. I, I was just going to say, I don't know if it's necessarily time sensitive, but I think they wanted this contract to overlap with the current vendor so that they're not in a position where, you know, if this company doesn't work out, they don't have a vendor to supply the uniform. So I think it was more of a comparative. I don't know how that affects the bottom line. Chief Tommy did communicate with me earlier today. And they do go through uniforms a lot because when they're involved in hazmat issues and, you know, medical issues, you know, the uniforms get to a point where they can't be utilized anymore. But I was just going to say, if you wanted to defer it until the next meeting. Yeah. I would recommend that. July 12th. And just get the information uh, as to what our neighboring towns are paying on, a, on, a, on an annual basis. I think that that would just, that would, that would uh, so, appease me. And you can do it on a per person basis or you can just do it. I know that our, our neighbor to to the north of us is about the same size um, organization. So just kind of getting an idea so that we know. That's all. So I'll just add that in the future, uh, Mr. Moore, if you have a concern like this, um, that it's that it's brought up. Of we course. Had, we had our meeting, our pre-commission uh, meeting yesterday. Yes, sir. Yeah, I agree. Concerns about tomorrow? Nope. But you had one. And well. This, and this is one that probably should have been brought up. So um, I, I, I got, I'm glad you're sharing it now. Um, but if we could be a little bit more proactive so we're not in this type of situation. Fair enough. So direction is to bring back the matter July 12th, regular city commission meeting. That is four weeks from now to include the additional background information so that we can prepare accordingly. Need a motion. So moved. Okay. Second. Call the roll, please. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. 
Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Walston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Okay, moving on to oh, uh, regular agenda 7A, and uh, this is a quasi judicial um, item on our agenda, so I'm going to read the quasi judicial rules into the record. This hearing shall be conducted in accordance with quasi-judicial rules. The applicant and the city will be allowed to 20 minutes each to present their case. The public shall be allowed to speak for three minutes each or a maximum of six minutes if a person represents an organization or a group of people who are present but agree not to speak. The city commission staff and the applicant may be allowed to cross-examine a witness. The city and the applicant will be allowed to offer rebuttal testimony. The decision to approve or deny an application or appeal may not be legally made upon a personal views as to whether a project is a good project or not, nor may a decision be based on the number of citizens who support or oppose a particular project. The law requires that all decisions must be based on whether or not the project meets the requirements of law, the comprehensive plan, and the land development regulations. So at this point in time, if there's anybody who's going to be speaking on um, resolution uh, uh, 74 22 or 89 22, which is 7B. Let me see if there's any others. Are there any others? Do you know? I think that's it. Yeah, just those two. Uh, please stand and uh, raise your hand and be sworn in. I have the authority of Mr. Nemi as a notary of the state of Florida. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Okay, so let's talk about ex parte communication on the um, 7A, which is um, the SWAN, I believe. Any ex parte communication? Yes, I met with uh, the applicant and the representation. Okay. Yes, I met with I met with the attorney. Okay, and to I believe I spoke with the applicant, Mr. Schiller, and Mr. Costello. I spoke with Mr. Schiller as well. Okay, and I, I didn't I didn't have an opportunity. I, I I know I had the invite, but I didn't speak with anybody. But if there was anything, it would be on my server. Okay, so at this point in time, let's let the staff go ahead and um, uh, put the file into the record. Good evening, Anthea Geniotis, Development Services Director, and I'd like to enter file 2022-062 into the record. Mr. Schiller is here um, with an explanation of the request. Very good. So, thank you uh, thank so you. much. Mayor and Commissioners, before I begin, may I pass out this this letter? This is from a community member. Um, she wrote, actually wrote a note to each one of you, so I just wanted to put that into the record and make sure you had a chance to see that before I got started tonight. Uh, good evening. My name is Neil Schiller with the Government Law Group right across the street at 137 Northwest First Avenue in Delray Beach, Florida. I'm here tonight. Uh, representing the Delray Beach Swan or the Delray Swan project with my cohort uh, Jeff Costello. Uh, get started. I have 42 slides. I have 20 minutes. That's less than 30 seconds of a slide. So I'm going to go fast. Um, so we're requesting tonight is a waiver from this code section to allow us to submit an application to abandon a sidewalk easement and Southeast Second Avenue. Uh, again, we feel the waiver should be approved because we'll convey the necessary easements to the city. There is a precedent that's been set. This is a blighted roadway that will be substantially improved as well as the pedestrian and multimodal experience and connections. So here is why we need the waiver. You can see uh, the highlighted code section that says streets and alleys may not be abandoned. We're here tonight because of the word may and not shall. If it was shall, I know we would not be here tonight. So this is permitted by your code uh, specifically. Here are the four waiver criteria. And again, we're not focused on the actual abandonment tonight, just on the waiver to allow us to submit an application, go through the process, and then hopefully uh, would come before planning and zoning and this board. This is a, an aerial of the location. You can see that this is the west side of Southeast Second Avenue. It, the road is actually, there are two Southeast Second Avenues in the city. It's bisected, or they're bisected by the, uh, the FEC railway. 
This is the creation of Second Avenue and what we're seeking to be uh, abandoned is that yellow area. Um, and what's interesting, important to note here is that when this was created, it created an irregularly shaped city block that is not your typical 285 foot by 600 foot rectangle. It's more of a trapezoidal form. This is Southeast Second Avenue prior to the uh, P3 that occurred that installed parking spaces and you can see a couple of things. Very, very small sidewalk area on Southeast Second Avenue on the north side. And then in the middle of the block, you see the cars backing into Southeast Second Avenue to leave that, that business, which is clearly an unsafe traffic issue. After the P3, you can see the parking spaces have been installed, lighting has been installed, the general beautification of the area has started, and this uh, application would continue that. So if this were to be abandoned, we uh, have some, air, some uh, designs that we wanted to show you that really convey the, what we're trying to do, which is increase pedestrian activity and multimodal activity while making this beautiful and safe for the residents. This is the northeast corner of 2nd and 2nd. You can see uh, a bunch, several people uh, gathering on that corner with the- Hold on just a second. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes. Um, I actually think that it's inappropriate for the commission to consider what the project's gonna look like. The basis for this waiver is simply to allow Mr. Schiller's client to submit an application for an abandonment. This is not a site plan approval, and so I would caution the commission in considering um, any testimony or evidence to that effect. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, I'll just go, I'll, you get the idea of what we're trying to do here with uh, the abandonment and what it potentially could look like. And I'm not gonna dwell on it, but there are large pedestrian spaces and increased landscaping and uh, sculptures. And most importantly, this wave feature, uh, which is one of the things that the abandonment allows us to do is create this beautiful um, brick paver uh, for Southeast Second Avenue. So how would this work? Uh, we would intend to maintain and enhance all the existing vehicular and pedestrian access and connectivity. Um, we would deliver all the necessary easement agreements to the city, all the utilities, access, traffic enforcement, et cetera. The maintenance of the street will be at the applicant's sole cost and responsibility going forward. Uh, public access and safety is maintained and enhanced with connectivity to Atlantic Avenue. Uh, it does allow for creative street design and provides additional density and flexibility for the project, which equates and results in more civic public open space and more parking spaces being required. So here are the criteria. Uh, it shall not adversely affect the neighboring area. In fact, we think this abandonment will positively impact the neighboring area because of the beautiful street paver design, because of the increased opportunities for pedestrian connectivity, multimodal connectivity, uh, increased and improved street lighting and landscaping. Um, again, this will actually be a significant benefit. Um, it shall not significantly diminish, diminish excuse me, the provision of public facilities. Uh, again, the applicants providing all the easements to the city, uh, including access, sidewalk, public parking, landscaping, and lighting, utilities, and traffic enforcement. And it's important, and we'll get to this, Second Avenue, or this Southeast Second Avenue, the west side, was not included in the 2017 CRA City Second Street Avenue Beautification Project or the current City CRA Neighborhood Improvement Project. So another criteria is not to create an unsafe situation. And again, by uh, improving the pedestrian activity and multimodal environment, we're actually making the street safer. Just by adding lighting on that street, we're making it safer. By adding more sidewalks, we're making it safer. Uh, does not result in the grant of special privilege. So there have been three other different uh, precedents in terms of abandonments that have maintained public access as part of a new development, which have resulted in streets that have exceeded actually the city standards. This has occurred at uh, Astor Condominium, Caspian Apartments, Atlantic Crossing. Uh, and again, this is Northeast 7th Ave, which was abandoned to accommodate Atlantic Crossing as part of the settlement agreement. So in the CBD, if you're going to get a waiver, you need uh, four more conditions that you have to meet. 
Um, one A or A is not result in an inferior pedestrian experience along a primary street. Well, not only is Southeast Second Avenue a secondary street, but we're actually significantly improving the pedestrian experience on that street uh, by proposing a complete street design and pedestrian experience. Uh, and again, the abandonment and the project will be a significant improvement to the ex that experience. Uh, B is shall not allow the creation of significant incompatibilities with nearby buildings or uses of land. Uh, actually, the Southeast Second Avenue and the development or abandonment of an excuse me in the resulting project will actually improve the transition from the FEC railroad to the single family residential that is to the west of the project. Additionally, the neighboring property owner to the south and uh, my client have already come to terms. Uh, they have approved all the necessary applications and fully support the project. If this were project or uh, if this street were to be abandoned, um, the neighbor to the south would convey his interest to that street to my client uh, and they have already worked out that deal and, and, and in return we would give them the necessary access easements uh, for his property. Uh, the third uh, CBD specific waiver condition are, is shall not erode connectivity of the street or sidewalk network or negatively impact the adopted bicycle and pedestrian plan. And again, we're uh, actually doing the opposite. We are improving the connectivity of the street and sidewalk network uh, from 2nd Avenue all the way uh, to, it creates a great connection to Atlantic Avenue. Uh, new sidewalks, new landscaping, new lighting, pedestrian oriented spaces and plazas. And then uh, the last CBD specific waiver condition is not reduce the quality of uh, uh, civic open spaces provided under the code. And actually, uh, because of this abandonment, we're providing an additional uh, almost 2,000 square feet of uh, civic open space as part of the project and as part of uh, the resulting abandonment if it were to be approved. Other considerations related to the waiver and the abandonment, uh, there are four. One, this area needs stabilization. It, it, it says so in your code, I'm not in your code, in your comprehensive plan, the highlighted map uh, is, is right there for you. Secondly, as I alluded to earlier, there have been two projects on this street or around this street and none of them have really impacted Southeast Second Avenue at all. This 2017 city CRA project was only focused on the east Southeast Second Avenue, not on the west side. The only project that's been done, uh, substantive project other than some milling and paving that was recently done, was the street lighting and parking project as part of the P3. The current Osceola Park City CRA project has almost every street in this neighborhood affected or touched or improved except Southeast Second Avenue. You can see the graphic right here. It's the one of the only streets that's not impacted at all by the city CRA project. Ladies and gentlemen, we are willing to do the work and spend the money to upgrade the street and bring it up to Delray Beach standards. As you've heard me multiple times as part of the Delray Beach Swan proje project, we meet a multitude of uh, ideas and intentions of the Osceola Park master plan, lighting, landscaping, parking, uh, and all of the strategies. These are just highlighted for you uh, so you can see how uh, we are consistent with the Osceola Park master plan and the update. So there are some public benefits of the abandonment. We address the needs of Southeast Second Avenue without costing the city any money. Uh, the streetscape will be uh, maintained in perpetuity uh, at the applicant's sole cost and expense. The resulting abandonment would not increase the height of the building at all. It only actually makes it five feet wider. It does result in more civic open space, more parking spaces, allows for greater design flexibility. Um, and there are some, and the applicant does have rights to both sides of the road, which is a unique situation in this, in this aspect. Uh, in response to staff concerns, they're concerned about tremendous benefits to the applicant, which I'll get into about the net impact of the abandonment and the costs associated with that, negative impacts on the neighborhoods, and, and setting a precedent. So, 
Uh, we evaluated the business deal because this is a business deal like anything else. The city is getting improved street design with street lighting, sidewalks, pavers, utility relocations and upgrades and pedestrian amenities. Additionally, there's continued maintenance and improvement of Southeast 2nd Avenue, along with six more workforce housing units as promised, uh, and 2,000 uh, plus or minus square feet of more civic open space. What's the developer getting? Well, the developer is getting 18,700 square feet of land to use for density purposes. That land, because we intend to keep it open for traffic, uh, can't be built upon. Uh, as I told you previously, the building only gets five feet wider, not taller. It does allow for the development of 30 extra units. It provides control and flexibility over Southeast Second. And again, there's 2,000 plus or minus square feet more of civic public open space. So what we did is we looked at the costs and we really wanted to give you a true uh, picture of what these costs are. So we hired Burkhart Construction, who recently completed, uh, completed Clematis Street in West Palm Beach, Florida. And if you haven't been, it is beautiful brick pavers now. We asked them based on our plan that I showed you the photos that you're not supposed to remember. Um, that plan cost $3.9 million to construct with everything, it's utilities, street lighting, bricks, et cetera, and that's broken up. So that's $3.9 million. So then we looked at, well, what if we built the Swan and then uh, how are we going to, if we sold it, what are the unit per unit costs going to be or price per unit? And what we took is a comparable of all the other uh, uh, condo buildings that have been sold recently with similarly situated uh, environments. <clears throat> and we found that an average price per unit is $383,000. And an average price per square foot is about $360 a square foot. And then the last thing we did was we hired Cornerstone Group of South Florida, a well-respected well -respected appraisal firm, and they evaluated our business deal. And they looked at the estimated end unit value, $400,000 per unit. We're getting 30 more units. It's $12 million more. Then they looked at the cost to build each one of those units, or those 30 units in total, excuse me. And that cost is $10,321,350. Uh, and then the minus the estimated cost of the road reconstruction, uh, so it is a net loss right now at $2.2 million to do what we're seeking to do with the design, construction, amenities, and the maintenance. But when we look at the business deal, you have to assign some cost uh, or value to the land. I've, I've learned that uh, firsthand. So with that being said, this is what the business deal looks like. There's a $3.9 million cost for the improved street design with the broken up costs. That utility ro relocate and upgrade is substantial and something that I believe the city would have to do at some point in the future. Uh, so anyway, what you look at is essentially a $374,000 cost to the applicant if you assign the um, um, $100 square foot uh, cost of the land that we're seeking to uh, get via the abandonment. The city engineer previously prepared a memo about this uh, abandonment, not necessarily, uh, or the waiver, excuse me, not necessarily abandonment. And the basis for the reg his recommendation of denial are all these different code uh, provisions and not actually any engineering. He didn't look at whether or not the provision of utilities was going to be diminished. He didn't look at whether or not public access was going to be diminished or if the road was even going to be unsafe. And so I would ask that, again, we're trying to seek an opportunity to apply for the abandonment. And I think that's when the city engineer can really um, uh, vet the application and make some recommendations. Uh, neighborhood support, there hasn't been any opposition to this project. We've reached out personally to every property owner in the area. The, our thumbs up uh, is an indication that the property owner supports the project. We have 
uh, more than 160 petitions and letters uh, that we've collected. The letter that I, I passed out before you is from Remus Shutters, Michelle Remus. She took the time to, wrote, to write a little uh, blurb about the lack of sidewalks on Southeast Second Avenue and how we need more sidewalks there. And this project or this abandonment would start that, pr this waiver would start the abandonment, which would start that project. And in conclusion, I'm making it uh, with time to spare, Mayor. Um, in conclusion, we meet all the criteria for the waiver. Um, we really feel that this is a unique situation. This is a unique, uniquely situated lot located next to the FEC corridor with a applicant that is willing to invest millions of dollars into this area that frankly, for whatever reason, the city hasn't. And we're looking to upgrade and improve the area, and we hope with your vote tonight we'll be able to start to do that. And we're here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Oh, sorry. Okay. okay. Staff report. <laughs> Okay, so this is a waiver to allow the consideration of an alley abandonment. Um, ultimately, the um, right of way in question, of course, is Southeast 2nd Avenue, which extends between Southeast 2nd Street and Southeast 2nd 3rd, where the road then dog legs. Um, the zoning is commercial core. This is the central business district, the railroad corridor subdistrict, where we just processed a um, amendment to allow increased density and intensity up to 70 units per acre in this district. It's the um, highest in the downtown um, as an effort to spur redevelopment. Um, so there is a there is a project at play. Um, I'm not going to show you images of it, um, but ultimately the, this. Um, project came in with the abandonment request, with easement um, abandonment requests, and to really move forward with a, another round of technical advisory committee comments and take it ultimately to the boards, we kind of need to know the boundary of the property. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately that affects things like density, setbacks, FAR, and other things. So why do we need the waiver to even consider this in the first place? Um, when the um, overhaul of the central business district um, LDRs was conducted in 2015 this section was added and it was added with the purpose and intent under 4413 J that the highly connected street and block structure of the downtown CBD area is a critical component of the cultural and historical character of the city um, the network fosters multimodal options by um, reducing bike and walk distances and allows, which I think I've done some paraphrasing or bad grammar, and allows um, traffic to disperse. So this overall grid that is part of downtown is part of the character that makes downtown great. And so ultimately, I think the concern was after repeated um, different chipping away of the grid had happened over the years, the um, commission at the time wanted to add an extra safeguard in to make it not quite such a clear process to um, abandon streets. And the actual waiver provision is in that section and it says streets and alleys may not be abandoned, vacated, or closed to accommodate new development. The mobility element of the Always Delray plan also states, do not grant abandonment of right of way unless it's conclusively demonstrated that there is not, nor will there be, a need for the use of the right-of-way for any public purpose. So when you're asking to abandon a right-of-way and you're at the same time offering vehicular pedestrian access and utility easements, clearly that area still has a public purpose that is needed. So um, that's an issue. Osceola Park Redevelopment Plan, while it does not specifically direct um, any specific improvements to second. It also does not direct the city to use as a tool to um, incentivize redevelopment to consider giving up its streets and alleys to increase development potential. So downtown's hopping. A lot of you um, certainly 
um, talk to me about <laughs> the many, many projects going on downtown. And I think it's important to recognize that we have significant development happening downtown that has not necessitated the abandonment of streets and alleys. Everything from the Delray Market uh, to hotels to um, residential, um, which have all managed to redevelop, maintaining the city's grid. What abandonments do is it limits our ability to regulate street and road and access closures. Um, and it does increase the scale and mass. I mean, ultimately, Worthing Place is a bigger building because the alley was eventually absorbed within that project. And of course, so we've moved from a scale of the Colony Hotel to a scale of Atlantic Crossing, where Northeast Second was given up, which ultimately increases it. Now, it was given up for the idea, of very similar, of a different type of street design and uh, materials. But ultimately, the city does not control public access. How long is the road going to be closed? When are things going to happen with it? This is a very similar proposal to what was kind of added to the code in 2015 for those concerns. So we, we look at this project, um, and this piece is not in, but is cooperating. So even though it's not in the boundary, they are you know, participating. Um, here's a view of the street today. Um, there were some improvements. Um, the, um, one of the owners did the, um, a really remarkable thing, in my opinion, which got FEC to agree to allow public parking in their right of way, um, which is a benefit both to the property but also to the city. Um, we have, um, this is the piece on the end. And so while, yes, there have not been um, major improvements to the street, until recently, it has been owned by various different owners with different driveways and part of the benefits of a cohesive development coming. While some of us don't like when the really big developments come in, they are also an opportunity to get a consistent design implemented together at the same time for the whole street. So what will the abandonment do? So the development, um, by abandoning 18,600 square feet and turning it into an access easement um, increases the FAR of the project by about 55,000 square feet. Um, it will, we round density down, um, but again, we've got to get those exact numbers to figure out uh, exactly what the um, development can build. It would result in 29 additional units if that's what it's used for. Um, of that, of those 29, six would be workforce. This district requires 20% workforce so that's a benefit and the civic open space requirement for the development would increase um, over um, my estimate was 1674 but around 2,000 square feet I think is fair so I mean ultimately the considerations are does a public purpose remain um, do do is eroding the public how much does this erode the public street network it does terminate where third ends, the second doesn't get into 